Kicking off the list at number 10, 18 years old. Queen Victoria's reign began back in 1837 and lasted until the Queen's death in 1901. At just age 18, Alexandria Victoria had to rise up to the throne. She was born on May 24th, 1819. Queen Victoria was the fifth in line when she was born, so right off the bat, it was actually highly unlikely she would ever get the crown to begin with. And then one by one, all of her family members began passing away. In four years, three of Victoria's cousins passed, and then her father and her grandfather both died a week apart from each other. So by the time 1830 rolled around, Victoria was only 11 years old, and already she was next in line for the throne. Number nine, the Kensington system. So as if that wasn't already stressful enough being at that age and already seeing what's happened, Victoria was brought up under the Kensington system, which if you haven't heard of before is pretty awful. Victoria's mother, Duchess Victoria of Kent, created this Kensington system to control her daughter, ideally. She literally isolated the child from playmates or even family members. Her mother did this to keep her pure. Yeah, the system sounds awful. Her mother would monitor her every single action, including who she can see or speak to. Victoria only had two playmates growing up entirely. She had her half-sister, Princess Fedora of Lenigan, and the Duchess's attendant, Sir John Conroy, his daughter, Victoria. I mean, I only had three friends growing up, but this, this is just cruel. This is a whole new level. She shared a room with her mother until she was the queen. She literally couldn't walk down the hallway alone without her mother being right there by her side. Victoria has reflected on her childhood, and obviously she hates John. John Conroy for manipulating her mother, she refers to him as demon incarnate. Number eight, publicity. The Duchess was pretty cruel to Victoria just because you're next in line doesn't mean it's gonna be glamorous speed dating and no one's doing a musical number while you meet your handsome Prince Charming. It's nothing like that at all. Victoria was forced to go on these long, excruciating, boring tours around England in hopes for the Duchess to sell her daughter to the public, the public eye. So these crowds would start to gather at all these appearances. They loved the young Victoria. Thing is, during one of these tours, October 1835, Victoria got really sick, she had a bad fever, and the Duchess was using the weak Victoria, she was taking advantage of her. But luckily she got better, and obviously her mother couldn't do anything crazy, but she, was, she had her sights set on her while she was sick, that's pretty cruel, that's disgusting. Number seven, name change. Every year on May 2-4, we set off fireworks and we have way too many hot dogs. It's the best, right? It's called Victoria Day. It's for sure called Victoria Day, right? There's no question about that, Victoria Day, her day. Well, back in 1819, Victoria was christened in an almost private ceremony, it was small, and Victoria's uncle, Prince Regent, only let a few people come. Her name, as I mentioned earlier, was originally Alexandrian Victoria, and at that time, the name Victoria wasn't regal. It was of French origin, almost an odd name to have at the time, really. So when this throne snuck up to her, she was advised to change her name to something more mm, traditional, but as our calendars tell us, she said, nah, I'm good, I'll keep it. Number six, moving out. Queen Victoria had turned 18 right before she was handed the crown. The timing here was key because now this meant Victoria could leave and just do things. Yeah, for once in her damn life, she could leave her mother and John. She moved from Kensington to Buckingham Palace, and after that point, Victoria, of course, didn't speak with John or her mother really ever again. It was just a couple years into Victoria's reign where John's influence started to get limited. He ended up resigning, and then he moved to Italy, and then when she was crowned a year later at Westminster Abbey, Queen Victoria wrote in her diary, I shall remember this day as the proudest of my life. Queen Victoria was the first royal family member to live at Buckingham Palace. She moved. She was like, I'm, no, I'm gonna go live over there. Maybe the first. I'm gonna start my new thing. I'm never gonna live in a palace. I'm like, that's a good castle. I like it. Driveway's a little long for me. Shoveling would hurt my Canadian back, but otherwise, I like the bricks. Number five, the bedchamber crisis. May 1839, the bedchamber crisis happened when Whig politician Lord Melbourne resigned as prime minister. This was a big deal because it was only a couple years right after Victoria became queen. So again, timing here was just not ideal. The first Prime Minister, Whig politician, Lord Melbourne, was close with Victoria originally. He actually convinced Victoria to appoint a good amount of her ladies in waiting. So he had power over her, but it was a mutual agreement. It wasn't like, you know, the other power that she had her whole life. This is, they were homies. They were homies, I said, in a video about Victoria. So in 1839, when Melbourne resigned, Tory Robert Peel came in to be Prime Minister, and he requested that Victoria dismiss these ladies in waiting and then replace them with Tory ladies. Well, since Victoria was an OG and these were her only real friends if there was such a thing growing up, she said no. So of course she was criticized for such a choice. Prince Albert luckily was able to have some of her ladies resign voluntarily so things smoothed over eventually, but the queen honestly never got a break, even on the happiest days, like number four, her engagement. 
The life of Queen Victoria wasn't anything like a fairy tale, obviously, as I've said anything so far. So when you think about the royal family, at least when I was younger, I thought being a queen or king was just eating chocolate all day and then you attend galas. Yeah, you just eat yummy foods, wear a crown, look cute, and then go to the ball. No, not quite. I, that's not really how it's like at all. Victoria had to do everything herself. She even had to propose to Prince Albert. It's royal tradition that nobody shall propose to a reigning monarch, so in October 1839, Victoria had to ask Albert for his hand in marriage. It all started when the pair were 17 years old. Victoria met the young prince, of course, at Kensington Palace. They were put together because Victoria's uncle felt like this could be beneficial down the road. They were first cousins, now they're getting married, which sounds bizarre, but as you've seen on this channel before, with royalty and stuff, it's quite common. Number three, first marriage. The wedding of Queen Victoria and Prince Albert happened in St. James Palace Chapel on February 10th, 1840. This was a big deal because it was the first time a ruling queen was getting married. This hadn't happened in 286 years. The last marriage of a reigning queen was in 1554, and that was Queen Mary I. Queen Victoria had 12 bridesmaids, wore white, had a lovely dress, thing was like 18 feet long, it was gorgeous. But it must have been so overwhelming for the young queen because she was isolated for her entire life, and then all of a sudden, what? You're getting married outside at 20 in front of all these crowds? After the wedding, Queen Victoria's head was hurting. It was probably so stressful, but she still had the time of her life. She wrote this in her diary after her wedding. She wrote, I never, never spent such an evening. My dearest, dearest, dear Albert. His excessive love and affection gave me feelings of heavenly love and happiness I never could have hoped to have felt before. He clasped me in his arms and we kissed each other again and again. His beauty, his sweetness, and gentleness, really, how can I ever be thankful enough to have such a husband? To be called by names of tenderness I've never yet heard used to me before was bliss beyond belief. Oh, this was the happiest day of my life. Yeah, when you're locked up and you have a horrible duchess watching your every move, this day probably sounds like a nice break. A well-deserved break, I'd say. Eat all the cake you can have. Number two, attacks. Being the queen and all, a security team is always needed. And during her reign, there were multiple attempts to harm the young queen. The first attack was back in 1840. An 18-year-old man named Edward Oxford fired towards the queen's carriage. When Edward was accused of high treason, he was actually found not guilty due to insanity. A couple years later, in 1842, it happened again. This time, two men fired at her. In 1849, her carriage was attacked by William Hamilton. In 1850, as the carriage was passing the gates of Buckingham Palace, Robert Pate, a retired soldier, ran up and hit her with his cane. Victoria was okay, luckily, but of course she was shook. And then again in 1842, 1849, and 1872, attempt after attempt after attempt. But at one point, things were creepy and almost worse. Number one, Boy Jones. If you haven't heard of Boy Jones or anything that happened here at all, I saved it for last because it's very creepy. It's mind-blowing in a horrible way. A teenager stalked the Queen back in 1838 until 1841. His name was Edward Jones. This guy somehow managed to break into Buckingham Palace more than once. Just some Assassin's Creed going on here. Guy just knows our route, I guess. That's so scary. He would break in and he would hide under the Queen's sofa. He would sit on her throne and, one of the worst things ever, he would go through her drawers figuratively and literally. Like he would go and he would steal her clothes until eventually and thankfully the guy got caught. Number 10, queen of hating her daughter. Starting off this list with a bang would have to be the utterly despicable Maria Eleonora of Brandenburg, the queen of Sweden. Queen Maria here seems to be guilty of the crime of attempted delifing. That's a pretty crazy thing for a queen, but it gets even crazier when you find out it was her own daughter who she tried to do this to. For some reason, when the queen gave birth to her daughter, who she wanted to be a son, she instantly thought of her sweet, innocent little daughter as a dark and ugly monster with black eyes. Gotta love coming into this world and being hated purely for existing. As she saw her as a monster, Maria tried to have her daughter dispatched multiple times and I don't know what this crime would be called, but she even forced her daughter to sleep next to the rotting corpse of her own father. Maybe that's the true crime here, because this is messed up. Number nine, don't mess with the empress. The only powerful female emperor in the history of China has got to make you extremely ruthless, simply because you are a target and you would have needed to work to get to where you are. And you know what? Wu Zetian, who ruled during China's Tang Dynasty, was quite ruthless. She took her position of power by force, and she slayed many people in order to do so. But she didn't stop there. She committed more acts of slaying throughout her rule as well. And I don't mean like slay queen, although that does really work for this list, but no, she slayed people. 
and we don't support that kind of criminal behavior, even if you are above the law. To make matters worse though, it is reported that even her mother and grandchildren fell onto that list of victims, all because they were against her. Truly a ruthless queen. Number 8. Mommy Issues Empress Irene of Athens ruled between 797 to 802, and she co-ruled with her son for two decades before leaving it all by herself. That's not a crime. But how she did so was a bit more, I don't know, just a little outside the realm of legality by today's standards. Her son, Emperor Constantine VI, was not a popular emperor, and the empress was quite an ambitious and greedy woman. She wanted full control of the Byzantine Empire, and to do that, with the help of some political allies, Irene led a conspiracy against her own son. Poor parenting skills if you ask me, but hey, the two actually made up and were at least somewhat civil. That is until Constantine divorced his wife and married his mistress, turning the people against him and giving Irene the opportunity to lead another conspiracy and then have her son's eyes gouged out. Yay! Number 7. Rana Valona I honestly didn't know Madagascar had queens or kings. That's not because it doesn't make sense, I, I'm, just, I'm just dumb. Thanks to me being a young child, I thought the only royalty Madagascar had was King Julian. You know, like the lemur? King Julian! Like that, that King Julian. Um, but they did have kings and queens, and one of these queens was pretty damn brutal. Queen Rena I ruled Madagascar between 1828 and 1861, and there is absolutely no doubt that she would do anything for her kingdom. After King Radama I, her husband, passed away, she took over the crown, and during her reign, she put a lot of people to the axe, or whatever way they executed people in Madagascar. Her uncle was one who met the sticky end to protect her power. But some records state that Rena Valona ended her own mother's life by subjecting her to starvation. Rena Valona sent her mom to her room and didn't let her have dinner. Or any meals, really. That's never okay, and would get someone like us charged under the law with something. I don't know what exactly it would be, but it'd be something. Number 6. Pretty firmly against cheating. Not to be weird, but I can kind of see where this queen is coming from. At first. At first, I sort of get it, but not later on, just at first. Henry II of France had a lifelong affair with his mistress, Diane de Poitiers. And even while on his deathbed, he begged his own wife, Queen Catherine de Medici, to allow him to see her. Kind of really disrespectful to your wife, but I guess he loved his mistress too. I, mm, I'm kind of confused on the morals of this. However, the Queen was not confused on the morals and didn't give in to his plea. In fact, she even denied Diane entry into the room, letting the king pass away without having his dying wish granted. Damn. That ain't a crime. This queen had a daughter who took after her dear old dad when it came to the whole monogamous relationships, meaning she didn't really have them. When the queen mother found out about her married daughter's new romantic interest, she locked her daughter up in a castle and never saw her again. But she became even worse when she ordered her daughter's romantic interest to be executed in front of her. Now that is rough. And while she didn't do the deed herself, giving the order is kind of bad enough. It gets worse. Her son, King Henry, didn't like that she cruelly did this to her own daughter, so she had him dispatched as well. My goodness. Number 5. Bloody Mary Duh. Mary the First, or Bloody Mary as she is also known, was the first real Queen of Britain. But this reign didn't last very long, five years to be exact, before she was replaced by the much, much better Queen Elizabeth. But in that short five year span, Bloody Mary earned that title, let me tell you. Mary the First ordered war against the Protestants and slew quite a hardy handful of them for heresy. Which is interesting since her father, Henry VIII, was kind of the guy who made Protestants more of a thing in England, and then her sister was also Protestant and made it the main religion in England. History is full of people needlessly passing away because what they believe isn't the right thing. Anyways, to heat things up, Mary even had some of these Protestants burned on the spot. Some is kind of an unfair statement. You see, the Queen here was responsible for burning over 300 Protestants at the stake. Other kings and queens burned people at the stake for their faith. I mean, Mary's father did it, as did her sister. But it's the sheer amount of people that make her much worse and much more famous. Number 4. Taking over Queen Catherine the Great of Russia was obviously a Queen of Russia. But that don't mean she was actually Russian. She was actually German born. 
But she was Russian to get herself into power when it turns out her husband, Emperor Peter, was not very liked by his own people, as he showed a very obvious dislike for Russia, which is kind of weird. She took advantage of people's disdain, and while she may not have directly done the life ending here, it is pretty well stated that the act was committed by her supporters, and public opinion held her responsible. She was called the Great, but it seems she was actually kind of the absolute worst, even if she was a strong ruler. She does look very proud of herself in a lot of her paintings though, which, I mean, she overthrew her own emperor husband and became ruler of a country she isn't even native to. So like, yeah, I guess, good job, I think. Number three, La Loca the Loco. Finally, a queen not on this list for ending other people's lives. No, Juana La Loca was far worse than that. Not to be insensitive, but Juana La Loca was loco. She was the Queen of Castile from 1504 to 1516, and she suffered from various mental disorders. After her husband died in 1506, her father buried his body, but that didn't stop La Loca from opening the tomb and caressing her husband's non-living body from time to time. Ultimately, she even ordered people to dig up the body fully, and she would kiss her deceased husband's feet. I'm sorry, excuse me, I need, I need some water after that. That's disgusting. Mm, that's a lot. Mm -hmm. Oh good, we aren't done. Of course not. No, no, apparently, Juana would also carry his coffin everywhere with her, and even kept it under her bed. It wasn't until years and years later she allowed his burial outside her window, finally. Look, I, I get loving somebody, but dear lord, imagine what she was like when he was alive. Stage 10 clinger, 100%. Number two, let them eat cake. How about a queen that caused the whole revolution? That's gotta be a good one. We have almost all heard of Marie Antoinette. She was well known for splurging on things she shouldn't have and the countless affairs and scandals she was involved in. Like the scandal of the necklace. Countess de la Motte pretended to be the queen's friend and entered the French court in 1785. She fooled a member of high society in believing that the queen loved him, even going as far as to hire a lady of the night, disguise her as the queen, and convince the poor guy that Antoinette wanted to purchase a diamond necklace that cost 1,600,000 livres, which is almost $12 million by today's money. The amount of sheer greed and debauchery that happened while she was around made her own people rise up and fight back against the unfairness of the French monarchy. Good job, you made your people hate you, cause y'all ignorant. Number one, Countess not Dracula? Born in Transylvania, because of course she was, in 1560, Countess Elizabeth Bathory of Hungary was a Hungarian noblewoman. But more than that, she was an extremely infamous serial slayer. She used her position of power to defend herself from ever having to suffer the consequences of the heinous crimes she would commit. Okay, well, name the crimes, Adam. Okay, I will. Elizabeth spent years slaying servants and peasants just because she wanted to and enjoyed it. She did it so much that her own husband, Count Nadasti, went so far as to build his wife a torment chamber for her to do this more comfortably. Great husband, horrible person. Elizabeth also had a nasty habit of actually feasting on her prey. She would often bite and eat chunks out of them while they were still alive, and in one case, she may have even forced someone to cook and eat some of their own body. Eventually, her conduct became so appalling that a trial was held. It only took forever to happen. She was convicted on 80 counts, but was only sentenced to solitary imprisonment within her castle. That's it. Like, how is that okay? I don't get it. She thankfully met her end three years later in 1614, but my lord, was she a bad dudette. Not good. Number 10, Queen of the Nile. For me, it's fun to think about the day in the life of an ancient Roman or Egyptian. I can only hope it was as beautiful as textbooks, movies, and video games make it out to be. But something that I find interesting is that the Egyptians were using makeup all those years ago. Yes, that's right, Cleopatra being the bougiest of all the queens to ever grace our presence, or at least so Elizabeth Taylor would make me think so, had her fair share of makeup use. However, something that may not be fit for a queen was the Egyptian eye glitter. Oh boy, here we go. To achieve this, colorful insect beetles were crushed up and added to an applicable powder, where you would then brush that on your eyes. Look, bugs don't gross me out, but I don't exactly know if I'd want that all up in my business. To be fair, we shouldn't be grossed out because, uh, I hate to tell you, but 
There's some products we still use today that might have a cup or two of bugs in it, just saying. Number nine, Royal Bite. It would be difficult to specify a queen who had this done, as there are probably simply too many. And it's more of a, well, service, I guess, than a product, but hear me out. Something I'm just extremely fascinated in and frightened by at the same time. Taking place in Africa, Asia, and the South Pacific Islands. Your dentist's worst nightmare. Teeth sharpening. Ooh. Considered to be a thing of beauty. Many women, and even recently, have undergone this process of jungle dentistry. I for one cannot judge someone else's culture, however, I can judge the experience of acquiring such a look. And I know that just can't be fun. You ever get a cavity removed at the dentist and buddies just drilling into your tooth like John D. Rockefeller looking for some oil? Okay, well imagine someone filing your teeth down like a high school woodshop project. Yeah, no thanks. I get shivers just thinking about it, and all that blood and the powdered teeth just piling up in your mouth, and there's no suction thingy? Nah, that's just the worst, man. Nah, I, that ain't it. I talk to the chief, he's a dentist. That, that ain't it. Number eight, shampoo. What's better than having a hot shower after a long day and just, just rinsing off the woes of the day? Honestly, it's one of my favorite things. For me, a nice hair wash feels good with my favorite shampoo. And because I'm a guy, my body wash, shampoo, and conditioner are all the same product. It's what we do. However, queens of the Inca civilization had more lucrative beauty products, to say the least. I say product because this was a process. What am I talking about? <laughs> Fermented urine. What else, of course? Yes, that's right. The Inca's favorite way to combat those dry scalps was the forbidden lemonade. That's just gross. Don't drink that. They would have clay pots filled with the golden broth, and then it was cast aside to really let those flavors come together. Or at least I think that's what's happening. That's something a chef would say. Anyway, once it reached the desired level of fermentation, it was then used to clean hair. Oh man, what a way to make a queen stay fresh. Just message to the Incas, just stick to soap, man. Don't do that. Imagine just like having it just, one just, oh, just, it feels so good. Oh, it smells great. I love this. This is fantastic. I love, this is so great. I love this. Number seven, foundation. Sometimes all a girl or a queen needs is a little foundation. After all, who doesn't want to have a gorgeous glowing complexion? Especially if you're a queen. The royalty of ye olde Europe felt the same way, except their products were a little different than to what a queen would have today. Some products are hard to pitch and market, but this... Uh, this would be even hard to market in a Super Bowl commercial. The queens of ye olde Europe fell into a trend of having pale skin. So, to achieve this mixture, it was a mixture of lead and vinegar to coat the face that gave the desired pale look. That just sounds awful. Talk about scandals. Our queen's makeup makes her smell like she's been working away in a lead mine all day. Naturally, this couldn't have been pleasant, but a girl's gotta do what a girl's gotta do. Beauty is pain, and sometimes it's really stinky. Number six, cowboy action. Okay, not exactly a queen, but pretty close. Hear me out, guys. Sarah Winchester was the widow and the heiress of the Winchester rifle fortune. This included $20 million and 50% of shares of the company. Man, I wish that was me. And in case you didn't know, the Winchester Rifle Company was responsible for making guns good when a lot just weren't. And that model of rifle unfortunately took a lot of lives. So it's said that the Winchester Mansion was haunted by the ghosts of the poor souls who found themselves at the business end of a repeater. Sarah allegedly was missing a few cards from the deck. All sixes and nines, just, just a little crazy. So in her craziness, it's fair to say she spent some time with a Winchester rifle or two, which is quite a scandalous product for a queen who thinks she's seeing ghosts. Plus. Women back then, besides Annie Oakley, weren't supposed to handle things like that because it was the 1800s and men were just really mean and stinky and come on guys, give her a break. I ain't that woman can't shoot a gun. What, what are you talking about? Number five, toxic eyes. It's no mystery that beauty products today can be filled with all kinds of lovely chemicals that make you look great. And there's tons of products from the past that could be labeled as scandalous. Well, how about putting literal poison in your eyes? Yes, that's right. Back to the women of ye olde Europe. The very same queens with the pale skin wanted eyes that sparkled. How to achieve this? Well, you just put drops of belladonna in, in your eyes, which, if you didn't know, is poison. Like, just straight up poison. It's bad. It would dilute the eyes, and that was considered beautiful. If you think that sounds like it's bad for your health, that's because it is. Long-term exposure to the belladonna drops would lead to blindness. Yeah, it's kind of a trade-off there. Good-looking eyes, go blind later. Yeah, no thanks. Number four, the neck stretcher. 
No, that is not a WWE wrestler or finishing move, although it really sounds like one it could be. No, this is something I've always been fascinated with, really. It's just kind of out of this world. I'm talking about neck rings from some African and Asian cultures. Basically, over there in some cultures, the more a woman looks like the Kaminoans from Attack of the Clones, the better. And that means it's time to stretch the neck by slowly placing rings around a young woman's neck until it grows. And then you keep slapping those bad boys on until you've got so many rings on your neck, it'll make you say Sifo Dias. Had to fit a little Star Wars in there somewhere. Truth be told, the neck doesn't actually stretch. It's more the shoulders are dropping from all that weight, which can weigh up to like 15 pounds or something. It's crazy. And if common folk take part in this lengthy procedure, the most beautiful of queens certainly did too. Number three, this, this makes no sense. Look, with all the crazy, super awful, weird things that humans have done, at least most of the time in my opinion, there's a method to the madness. Poisonous eye drops do make your eyes pretty, sure. The urine shampoo does get rid of my dandruff, okay. But with this one, I mean, there's just no way. It, it just doesn't make sense. And I would have no idea how to present this to royalty, especially the queen of the Nile. Toothpaste made from mice, yes. Just how though? I, I, it doesn't make any sense. Like how is a mouse supposed to make your breath feel fresh over some herbs and nicer smelling things? Basically, you cut the mouse in half, like that's a normal thing to do, and then you put that in your mouth. Also, have you ever tried catching a mouse? That's not easy. Is there a mouse farm? So many questions. To me, it's just a really bad look to have the queen swishing around half a mouse in her mouth like some of Listerine's finest mouthwash. Ugh. Number two, blondes have more fun. I don't know if that's true or not, but it's a popular hair color. And believe it or not, I used to have natural blonde hair, like super blonde. And then Harambe left this plane of existence and my hair got darker, cause life got darker. Now all I wanna do is listen to MCR in my room and write in my journal about how nobody understands me while MTV plays on the TV my parents bought me in the background. Some people wanna go blonde. This was true of royal women in ye olde times. So time to reach for some good old fashioned hair dye right off the shelf, right? Let's read the ingredients together. Water, well, that's good, okay. <laughs> I got a water. <laughs> a lead, well I got tons of that on my face already, so that's fine. And what is this, sulfur? What? Yeah, that's right, that's <laughs> sulfur. Imagine slathering that stinky goodness all in your locks. This was something that the highly esteemed Tudor women actually did, or at least tried. I feel like you need a whole truck of this stuff to work. But then again, the smell. That's not how a queen should smell, is it? It's not right now, you shouldn't, it's not. Number one, the Canary Girls. When Great Britain was at war, the queen was a symbol of their freedom and democracy. True British strength to keep on carrying on. So the next time the queen goes to visit a munitions factory to cheer on the women who are working hard day and night for the war effort, she might want to keep her distance. The high explosives used in the artillery shells, famously known as TNT, I'd break down the scientific name, but we all know <laughs> my track record with reading. <laughs> I can't. It is a very volatile substance, but not just for the explosive capabilities, but it's also toxic. Yeah, I didn't know this, I learned this. Very similar to the radium girls of the same fate. TNT with enough exposure can turn skin and hair a yellowy orange color. Now, we can't have her royal majesty showing up somewhere looking like Big Bird, can we? To avoid being a literal blonde bombshell, perhaps stay away from the factory, your royal highness. In our number 10 spot, we have Irene of Athens. Starting off this list today, we are heading back to the Byzantine Empire. Irene of Athens was the mother of Constantine VI, and while the pair co-ruled together for almost two decades, things ended in quite the tragedy. After the pair co-ruled, Irene did go on to rule on her own from 797 to 802 CE, but you might be wondering how she managed to outrule her son. Well, Irene, the ambitious ruler, wanted full control all to herself, so she asked for the help of some political allies to pull off a scheme against her own son. She began to lead a conspiracy against him to try and get him out of power. The duo did end up reconciling their relationship, but this is not where the story ends. In 786, the public began to turn their backs on Constantine because he had decided to divorce his wife and instead marry his mistress. Irene saw this as a second chance and once again chose to conspire against her own son. Honestly, fool me once, shame on you. Fool me twice, this lady did not care. Here's where things in the story get exceptionally gory. Irene not only ordered the arrest of her son, but also ordered that his eyes be gouged out. Yep. 
That's how good old Mumsy came into power. In our number 9 spot today, we have Elizabeth Bathory. Elizabeth was a Hungarian noblewoman who lived from August of 1560 to August of 1614. She was born into one of the oldest and most powerful families in Transylvania, and she was well educated and ran various estates and bore many children. Oh, and this is all happening while she was also killing young women and bathing in their blood. Yeah. Weird, gross, terrible. Elizabeth is known for killing her servants and bathing in their blood as she believed it would keep her young. Guess no one told her about moisturizing and minding your own business. All accounts of Elizabeth remember her as a terrible, evil person. It is said that her number of victims most likely ranges somewhere from 175 to 200, but some claim it might be as many as 600 people. It is no wonder she is referred to as Countess Dracula. In our number 8 spot today, we have Olga of Kiev. Olga of Kiev became queen regent in 945 CE after her husband was killed, and during the time her son was just too young to rule. Olga knew that once her son was old enough to be crowned king, her power would be taken away, so she needed to see her wishes carried out before that happened. Her wishes included the capturing and killing of those who took the life of her husband, which was carried out using scalding hot water. Yeah, don't even want to imagine what that would have been like. Don't kill the king, I guess. Historically, it doesn't seem to work out well. Apparently, in doing this, however, Olga developed a bit of a bloodthirst, and she would not rest until everyone associated with the people who killed her husband were all eliminated. She is the ultimate ride or die. It seems like if you even looked in the wrong direction or breathed in the vicinity of someone who had something to do with the king's slaying, you could kiss your own life goodbye. Olga took hundreds of people out of the tribe that the killers were from, she devised a plan to bury the tribe leaders alive, and she even came up with a plan to set fire to their entire village. It is said that Olga may have locked the tribe's leaders in a bathhouse and burned it down, but we don't know for sure. All we do know is that she was not okay. In our number 7 spot today, we have Wu Zetian. Throughout the long and storied history of China, there has only ever been one woman who held supreme power, and that is Empress Wu Zetian. Of course, considering this historic feat, she wanted to ensure that she kept her power by any means necessary. She had all of her rivals killed, so anyone who could possibly overthrow her or come for her seat on the throne was eliminated. The Empress ordered the execution of the previous Empress, as well as members of her own family. She had multiple methods of taking these people out, and rumor has it that she even had her own grandmother and two of her grandchildren killed for going against her. It didn't matter who you were, if you threatened her power, you are done for. It is said that after a while, the Empress decided to do a little less killy killy and a little more lovey lovey. Yeah. Apparently, she started spending more time with her lovers using some aphrodisiacs. You know, we all are a little crazy when we're young, but as we get older, we all crave the simplicity and just someone to love. Right? Of course, though people don't forget, and they were sure to exact their revenge. The people fought back and ended up having all of her lovers killed, and the empress herself was exiled. You know what they say about karma, she does not miss. In our number 6 spot today, we have Mary the First. Queen Mary the First didn't get the nickname Bloody Mary from nowhere. Oh no, this name was certainly earned. Mary was a Catholic queen in a Protestant country, which as you can imagine, was quite problematic when she ascended the throne of England in 1553. Although her reign only lasted 5 years, Years, she made a mark on history in a multitude of ways. She was the first true Queen of England, and she was quite a vicious ruler. During her time as Queen, Mary announced a war against Protestantism, which left many who belonged to the religion being charged with hearsay. Doesn't sound all that bad until you learn that at the time, the usual sentence for hearsay was to be burned at the stake. Nice. Mary was responsible for the burning of over 300 Protestants during her time as Queen, which unsurprisingly left her quite unpopular. Popular. In our number 5 spot today, we have Caterina de' Medici. Caterina was an Italian noblewoman born into a famous family. She was Queen of France from 1547 to 1559, with marriage to King Henry II, and she was the mother of four future French kings. It wasn't exactly surprising news that her husband, Henry II, had a lifelong affair with a mistress, but on his deathbed, when he was begging to see his mistress, Caterina refused and left him to die, a lonely and painful death. Do I entirely blame her? 
No, but it's also a pretty heartless move. You know what I mean? The daughter of the queen, Margaret, was said to be rebellious, but her mother wasn't just going to let her get away with it. The mother and daughter would fight over the married daughter's extramarital affairs, and it is said that Katerina's scream could be heard echoing throughout the palace. One fight between the two even saw her locking her daughter up in a castle, never to see her again. In our number four spot today, we have Agrippina the Younger. Roman Empress Julia Agrippina of Rome was pretty spoiled. She lived a lavish life. Her husband was the emperor and she had a family, but that just wasn't enough for her and she wanted it all. Julia was quite ambitious and she spent most of her early life trying to dethrone her predecessors. She believed that she and her son had a claim to the Roman throne by birthright, so she tricked her way into royalty by tricking her uncle Claudius into changing the Roman law so that they could get married. Suddenly though, after they got married and she became empress, Claudius died. Could be a really convenient coincidence, or it could have been a totally planned hit. I'm not accusing anyone, I'm just telling you what the word on the street is. She and her son Nero went on to rule Rome from 49 to 54 CE. Julia stayed by her son's side for as long as she could so that she could hold on to her power, but eventually Nero got tired of his mother manipulating him and he had to force her out of power. Julia, as you could imagine, was furious because power was the one thing in the world she desired the most, and so she rallied a group of supporters to try and overthrow him, but the plans backfired and she was expelled instead. In our number three spot today, we have Maria Eleonora. Maria of Brandenburg, the Queen of Sweden, has quite a horrifying story that relates to the birth of her daughter. Apparently, Maria wasn't feeling the overwhelming joy of childbirth because although she was hoping for a son, she gave birth to a daughter, Queen Christina. Maria wasn't shy about her opinion. She apparently screamed that she was given a dark and ugly daughter with black eyes. Okay, it's kind of rude. She referred to her new child as a monster and apparently just absolutely did not want anything to do with Christina and would have rather that she just didn't exist. Apparently she even placed Christina to sleep next to the corpse of her father who had passed away. It's like a different kind of messed up. Things clearly weren't right with Maria. In our number two spot today we have Queen Isabella. Isabella co-ruled Spain from 1451 to 1504 with King Ferdinand II and during her reign she had some pretty horrific views and feelings. She wanted to get rid of all Spanish Muslims and Jewish people from her kingdom. Sounds a bit like another evil ruler from history. In 1492, she ordered that all Jewish people either convert to Catholicism or get thrown out of the kingdom. She made them all come to Spanish court to either pledge their faith to Catholicism or get exiled from Spain. How horrible is that? The queen has also been attributed with establishing the Spanish Inquisition, which definitely is not a historical highlight. Both Isabella and Ferdinand are often said to have done great things for Spain, which in some cases is true, but at what cost and for what reason? In her number one spot today, we have Rana Valona I, the last queen of Madagascar. She ruled the kingdom for 33 years from 1828 until 1861. There is no doubt that she was committed to her kingdom and that she would do anything for it, but in this plight, she was cruel and violent. She initially came to power after the death of her husband, and once she had it, she was not letting it go. The queen was able to keep away the advances of the French and British, and she left the bodies of those who tried to attack out for display on the beach. In 1845, the queen ordered 50,000 subjects to build roads across the jungle for four months. They were meant to have this massive buffalo hunt. Well, she clearly wasn't thinking everything through because 10,000 of those poor souls died of starvation and exhaustion, and uh, not one buffalo was hunted. Some records of history state that she even had her own uncle executed in order to protect her power. And there is an even more gruesome story. Some people even state that she ended her own mother's life by starving her to death. That is some epic level of evil, if it's true. Number 10, Irene of Athens. First off, it's safe to say that all these people were a little spoiled, like the royal family times a thousand. When you're named after cities, you were like rich, rich. Irene of Athens was Byzantine's empress to Emperor Leo IV and co-ruler from 792 until 797, mother to son Constantine VI and sole ruler of the Eastern Roman Empire. Yeah, that's quite a resume, Irene. The quote, untimely death, okay, of her husband caused the throne to fall to her. 
Interesting. Although when Irene's son Constantine was a teen, several revolts tried to make him sole ruler. Mom caught on in 797, and Irene gouged out both of her son's eyes and imprisoned him, dying shortly after. Talk about grounded, dude. Mom's in that unconditional love, huh? A revolt years later overthrew Irene and exiled her to a remote island where Irene died months later. History's dark, huh? She's like, I'm gonna count to three, and then I'm gonna rip out your eyes. One? Two. Number nine, Valeria Messalina. Turning the clocks back to 17, you know, the year 17, just 17 AD, a classic. That in 2016, solid years. Metaphorically and literally, ancient Romans paved the way for following civilizations. They achieved some groundbreaking stuff in their time, but the empress of the Romans at that time, from 17 AD to 48 AD, Valeria Messalina, well, she was too focused on a more lavish business rather than ruling over armies at that time. Many accounts in history can confirm this. Pliny the Elder wrote about it as well, so you know it's the... Real deal. Valeria, she owned a big fancy house where ladies of the evening would come and go. She made a lot of money. This is where the finest ladies who weren't even involved in that kind of lifestyle or that kind of business, this is where they changed their minds. Know what I mean? It was a big deal. She was changing the game. Because of Valeria and the operation she was running, sometimes Valeria herself would participate in these games. Yeah, contests, if I may, to see who could tango with the most people in one night. Yeah, Valeria hit 25 in one night, so yeah, I'd say she ruined a few parties, for sure. I mean, her husband, Emperor Claudius, would at least agree, no? Number eight, Catherine de Medici. Catherine de Medici was an Italian noblewoman born into a famous, famous family. She was Queen of France from 1547 to 1559 with marriage to King Henry II, and mother of four future French kings, Francis II, Charles IX, Henry Henry the third. The years during which all her sons reigned have been called the age of Catherine de Medici, as she has extensive influence in politics in France at the time. Yeah, I'd say so. I mean, she raised those boys. She was like the secret hand making all the decisions, but she was cool and subtle. She's basically the Kris Jenner of her time. She married Henry, second son of King Francis, and after the king took part in some friendly jousting, he was smashed in the face and the splinters took his life days later. Ouch. Catherine then and her frail 15-year-old son were king and queen. When he died, she took power again till her 10-year-old son was ready. After that, he died. Same thing for the third son. The age expectancy was abysmal back then. She ruled with her youngest until her illness in her late 40s. Hmm. Number seven, Queen Rana Valona I, the last queen of Madagascar. Where to begin? Queen Rana Valona, one of the worst in history. She was born in 1788 and she ruled over the kingdom for 33 years. She was cruel, violent, and would often choose violence first in order to preserve independence over the island. She's known as the most ruthless queen in history. After the death of her husband, she just went mad with power. It's pretty sad. In the late 1700s, the king brought peace to the land, but of course there were traditionalists who opposed him, as everywhere that happens. And the king's uncle at one point tried to take him out, but a local warned the king. Okay. The king repaid said local by adopting his daughter, his daughter being Rana Valona. And now she was set to marry his son, Prince Radama. Now when her prince was alive, they didn't get along. And then come 1810, the king passed away, giving Rana Valona the promotion of a lifetime. It's also theorized, of course, that she, you know, poisoned him, so that's probable and horrible. Rana Valona kept away the advances of the French and the British and left bodies of those who tried to attack out for display on the beach. Yeah, just to give you an idea of how she handled things. Yuck. Number six, Bloody Mary. England's first female monarch, Mary I, ruled for just five years. The only surviving child of Henry VIII and Catherine of Aragon. Mary took the throne after the brief reign of her half-brother. They say she was an evil queen, but after doing my homework, yeah, I'd have some chips on my shoulders as well. Married at nine and 11? Everyone's just yelling at you because you're too young to have kids? Yeah, that's awful. She was promoted and demoted so many times, no wonder she did what she did. Every time she was close to the throne, all of a sudden her family tree was just like rearranged by law. Her dad decided to go down the other family route. Nice, nice. She's infamously remembered for burning 300 English Protestants at the stake, which earned her the nickname Bloody Mary. Her brother found a loophole with religion, so she was like, oh, oh, okay, yeah, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, light him up. She's also famously remembered as teaming up with her half-sister, Elizabeth I, and ruling together as sisters, making them the first two British queens. She was spoiled from birth, but she's kind of a badass. Anyone that did her harm, past or present, they were either sent to the tower or the chopping block. Checkmate. Number five, Empress Agrippina. Continuing on from 48 AD, 
The next leading lady in charge of ancient Rome was Julia Agrippina. And right off the bat, she was already spoiled. Yeah, she lived a lavish life. Her husband was the emperor. Of course she did. She had a family, but still, that somehow all wasn't enough for Empress Agrippina. And she wanted more. Julia was quite ambitious, and she spent most of her early life trying to dethrone her predecessors, of course, as one would. She believed that her and her son had a claim to the Roman throne by birthright, so she lied her way into royalty by tricking her uncle Claudius into changing Roman law just so they could get married. Yeah, love it. Gotta change the rules, I guess. We can do that? Okay. Suddenly though, after they got married and she became empress, suddenly, just out of the blue, huh, oh no, Claudius passed away. Crazy. Most people think Julia had something to do with it. That's likely the case. The empress and her son Nero went on to rule Rome from 49 to 54 CE. Julia stayed by her son's side for as long as she could so she could, you know, hold on to that little bit of power. But eventually Nero got tired of his mom talking over his shoulders. He's like, you know what? No, you go to your room. How does that sound? Nero then had her forced out of said power. And Julia, as you can imagine, was furious because power was the one thing in the world she desired the most. And so she rallied a group of supporters to try and, you know, overthrow throw the power, but plans backfired and she was expelled instead. Yeah, I'm watching a lot of Survivor right now. In Survivor, we call that a blind side, Jeff. Here we go. I'm so sorry, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, Ptolemy, I had to. Number four, Diane de Poitiers. Diane de Poitiers was a French noblewoman. She held power and influence as King Henry II's royal mistress and advisor until his death. And at the tender age of 15, Diane was married to Louise de Brez, the much, much older and grandson to the King of France. They had two daughters, Francois and Louise. After his death, she took interest in another very powerful man, her childhood crush, friend, and the new king. Uh oh. Henry married to Catherine de Medici. Wait, like that, Catherine? Yeah. Oh yeah, talk about a bizarre love triangle of power. After he got clocked in the face and died in a jousting accident, like I said before, Diane adopted the habit of wearing black and white for the rest of her life. Queen Catherine de Medici soon assumed control though, restricting her access to the royal chambers from Henry's deathbed and not even allowing her at the royal funeral. I mean, she's a married woman. Wives and their husbands' mistresses. Copying her style, stealing her man and her crown. She was exiled, comfortably. Like early, early rich retirement. Spoiled. What do you think? Number three, Princess Margaret. Princess Leia wasn't the only rebel, okay? Princess Margaret, I have to mention, she partied with rock stars during the 60s, okay? I'm not gonna leave her out of this list. The queen's younger sister was known as the rebel princess. She was seen for years and years as this badass, I guess, in the media, whatever. She passed away in 2002, but even to this day, we're trying to piece together her love life. Yeah, Pablo Picasso actually wanted to marry the princess. How fun is that? Also, I didn't realize how recent Pablo Picasso died. That was alarming, that was a wake up call. I guess my whole life's a lie. Sick. Hit that thumbs up button if you also agree that Pablo's more recent. Insane. Her wedding was the first to be aired on TV, okay? She was a big deal. The first televised royal wedding took place on May 6, 1960. Now, in 1968, word had spread that the princess had an affair with nightclub pianist Robin Douglas Home, who just a year and a half later sadly took his own life. And then come 1973, paparazzi got photos of her with a landscape gardener on her private island. Ooh la la. Ooh, big zoom on that one. One of the more unusual facts surrounding Princess Margaret was that she was cremated. Yeah, she had chosen to break tradition so that her ashes could be shared in the same tomb as her father. Yeah, how dare her decide what she wants to do with her body post-death. Ugh. Number two, Cleopatra. Talk about spoiled. Cleopatra Philopater was queen of the kingdom of Egypt from 51 to 30 BC and its last active ruler. From both Roman and Egyptian blood, Cleopatra accompanied her father, Ptolemy XII, into exile to Rome. But after a revolt in Egypt, his rival daughter, Berenice, claimed his throne. Ooh, siblings, am I right? What are you looking at? Berenice was killed in 55 BC when Ptolemy, her, and Cleopatra's brother returned to Egypt with a Roman military and took revenge. Yeah, more siblings. When dad died, the reign of Cleopatra and her brother Ptolemy 13 was born and short lived because arch nemesis Julius Caesar and him kind of hated each other. And yet, another war. Cleopatra sided with her brother's foe this time. Yeah, lots of switching sides back and forth, huh? Not a lot of loyalty in these families. I don't know. Eventually she cheated on him with Mark Antony, resulting in yet another war. After Antony was defeated, it led her love to take his own life out of shame and guilt. When Cleopatra found out about this, 
She poisoned herself following him into the afterlife. Yeah, that's loyalty. That's true love. The OG Romeo and Juliet. Also, Shakespeare does a wonderful show around the affairs and power of these two. Eternity was in our lips and in our eyes. Antony, act one, scene one. That's beautiful. It's beautiful, lovely. And number one, Clara Ward. Back in the late 1800s, the name Clara Ward would stir up quite the conversation. She was famous, but you know, for all the wrong reasons, of course. All it took was her bumping into a European royal. That's it, the rest is history. Since birth though, Clara was born into money. She didn't even need a royal husband in the first place, okay? She was born into a wealthy industrialist family, but she would sometimes visit the family mills, you know, make it look good, shake some hands, get some photos. Hey, yeah, nice button, awesome, see you later. She's involved, you know, she's part of the team. But then she crossed paths with the Prince of Caraman, Kime. He was there for trade, but when he left, he brought back with him said wife. People were freaking out at this point. A royal married a common American girl? This is unheard of. She was the talk of every town. See, unlike Meghan Markle, Clara loved to show off her newfound wealth. Some loved her in her image, others not so much. The marriage only lasted six years. Clara eloped with a Hungarian musician, and after her divorce, she turned to modeling. So yeah, it seems like she was in it for one reason. I don't know. I feel like she enjoyed the clout, just a little bit, right? Just a bit. Number 10, Marie Antoinette, Madame Deficit. The last queen of France, and maybe the last time royals got away with well, being royals. Her whole existence was opulence, which is really just salt in the wound, when most of your citizens probably can't even afford a portion of salt because they're broke or because there's food shortages. Wasn't a good time. But if you looked into the royal palace, you can bet she's got a pantry full of bread and a bowl of fruit just ready for the pickings. She even had the nerve to purchase a necklace that if through today's inflation, will be worth $12 million US. Ooh, that's a lot of money I wish I had. People were starving, and honestly, if people don't have anything, including food, ooh, it's not gonna be a good time. Imagine a whole country acting up because they haven't had their Snickers yet. Well, that ended up sparking a revolution. Very confusing, and in all that confusion, both the king and queen lost their heads. Wasn't good. Number nine, Queen Victoria, oh blighty. Man, it must be nice to have a whole era in history named after you. Maybe I'll get one one day. The cheddar time, I don't know, cheese, I don't know, big ched, we'll see what happens. Queen Victoria had some strange quirks about her. One that I can almost get behind, but not quite, is her niche for eating fast. Maybe too fast. I'm a guy who likes to make things simple, easy meals. The faster I can slip into a couch with an ice cold beer and a movie, I'm a happy guy. And or enjoy said food with the movie. Queen Victoria liked her meals to last no longer than 30 minutes. That means while you're on the appetizer, she's on the main course. And while you're on the main course, she's ordering coffee. Look, I respect the hustle. I get that. But maybe this is too much. That being said, are you going to be the one who brings it up to her royal majesty? Listen, if you want to see tomorrow's five minute brunch, you better keep it to yourself. Number eight, Cleopatra. Don't we all miss Elizabeth Taylor? I know I do. Sometimes, I wish I was her. Oh, she's just beautiful. Can you blame me? I honestly wish I was the real Cleopatra too though. All that power, and to not have one, but two Romans wrapped around her finger. Ooh. She was the last pharaoh of Egypt, but maybe had the most drama. Sure, Elizabeth Taylor was the most beautiful and chic woman in all of Hollywood, and she may or may not have had a few men wrapped around her finger too, but she never had to deal with the world's largest empire and her own throne, all whilst managing to stay the most beautiful and chic. I can barely manage to toast toast in the morning. Never mind all those affairs and, um, well, the marriage affairs too. There's a lot of, a lot of affairs happening. Number seven, Queen Isabella of Spain. Queen Isabella is known for a few things. A lot of stuff YouTube probably doesn't want me to talk about. Insert religious persecution here. However, I think she should be remembered for something else, something rather strange. When I was a kid, I would run around outside for hours, oftentimes ending up in the mud. My mother would always say, it's time to hose you down, son. And she wasn't wrong, because I, I probably needed a good hose down. Now, regardless of how much dirt was behind my ears, I didn't want to wash. I was this big stupid kid, can you blame me? I was proud of the scruff, but that's because I was going to have another wash, most likely within the next 12 hours. I always got hosed down at some point. Queen Isabella, however, boasted to others that she only bathed twice in her life. Sweet Lord, Mary Mother of God, woman, that is not something to boast about. Due to some water access issues, the Catholic Church was like, ah, baths? Who needs them? You know what? Baths are sinful anyway. Being so close to God, so she doesn't bathe. Cleanliness is next to godliness, except in that time period where not bathing means you're actually closer to the big JC upstairs, so that's how it goes. 
Number six, Queen Elizabeth II. No crusts. Queen Elizabeth II, the longest reigning monarch. God bless the queen. And God save the queen. Shout out to the UK. Chetty loves you. How you doing? Come, come and see me sometime. I love you guys. Now, sure, she's not the most awful spoiled queen in history, but she is a queen, and that does mean she can have things her way. Like, for example, all of her sandwiches have to have the crusts cut off. Yes, just like children. Yes, just the way I like them too. No, I'm not a big baby. I'm a big strong man who totally doesn't rely on the women in his life. Pfft. No, what are you, what are you saying? Dude, stop. Mom, I love you. Anyway. Well, yes, it's true, the queen's sandwiches have to have her crust cut off. Is it the worst thing ever? No, I don't think so, but what if her sandwich showed up with crust? We don't really burn people at the stake anymore, so what would she do? Would she fire them, I guess? It's kind of a little thing to get fired over. I don't know, anyway. Speaking of getting fired. <laughs> Number five, Empress Irene. Mother dearest, most people have fond memories of their mothers. Maybe you should call her, I'm just saying. Mother's Day happened, you should call her. Empress Irene was a woman who wanted power. Honestly, who doesn't? We've all got a little bit of Sith in us, yes. Her son, who had naturally inherited some of her power, was growing stronger by the day. Now, maybe it was ego, maybe it was envy, maybe her son just took down her live, laugh, love signs. I'm not sure. But Irene was not having any of it. So when her son least expected it, she had two guards apprehend him and had his eyes gouged out. Now, being that this was before 2022, this was a critical medical injury. And after nine days of grueling pain, and when I'm sure it was a lot of blind confusion, the injury proved to be fatal. So what's the lesson here? Uh, blood is not as thick as water? Ah, I don't really know, it's just messed up. Number four, Queen of Castile. Life can be tough sometimes, especially when we lose the ones we love the most. Everybody deals with things differently. The Queen of Castile is a person who deals with that, well, very differently. People passing on was no rare occurrence back in those days. There's a thousand reasons on how you could wind up six feet under. When the Queen of Castile's husband passed away from the disease of the month, she was devastated. Rightfully so, that's rough. However, that being said, sometimes you gotta take that with a little grace. For days, she would not leave her husband's side, even after he was a cold cadaver. Later on, that corpse would travel with her, apparently even stopping a carriage once to get out and kiss his feet. It's weekend at Bernie's, except a lot sadder and gross, and uh, not a charming 80s movie. Ugh. Number three, Carlotta of Mexico. This is a new one for me, but an interesting story nonetheless. Basically, France wanted a piece of Mexico, and I mean, come on, who doesn't? It's gorgeous. Carlotta was a Belgian princess who kind of just married into the royal family and got plopped down in some chaos in Mexico. There was a war, enough political strife, to make anyone involved in the Watergate scandal start to look for documents. It was messy, it wasn't a good time. It got so bad that she had to go back to Europe and basically made the call that all university students have to make after fraud. Week. Hey mom, uh, dad, uh, listen, um, yeah, I'm, I'm great. Uh, do you think maybe um, you could send me some money? Yeah, I, I need some help. Except her phone call wasn't like that. Her phone call was more like, hey, European nobility, uh, can you come please save my husband because he's about to get de-lifed and like stabilize the country? Thanks, spoiled princess calling, hi. It didn't work out in the end. He got de-lifed, she went back home and uh, well, she went a little crazy. Number two, Elizabeth Bathory. Serial D-lifers, your queen has arrived. I think this one is one of the more interesting cases in history. Usually when you think of a creepy D-lifer, that lurk of the night, you think of Gacy, Dahmer, you know, guys like that. It's not very often that it's a woman and or someone from before the 19th or 20th century. That's just how it goes. I'd also argue perishing and manual D-lifing was a part of life back in medieval times, so kind of hard to quantify what is and isn't a serial D-lifer or life taker. However, I think she counts. The body count is estimated to be somewhere in the hundreds, and a most peculiar rumor is that she bathed in the blood of her victims. Ooh, that's gross. Bathing in water, that checks out. Bathing in mud, you go to a spa, that checks out too. Bathing in beer, sticky and strange, but check, I've done it. Uh-huh, one time I did that. Bathing in blood, mm, that's a no cow zone for me, chief. While the bathing in blood thing might be false, the evidence of her crimes uh, were not. Imagine being so spoiled you can hide bodies. Mm. Number one, Queen Mary. Henry VIII was a big bad dude who wanted it his way. He wasn't the Burger King, although by looking at him you could tell he was uh, packing a few of those bad boys away too. No, he was the King of England and he had many wives and was spoiled himself. So, do you think his children grew up humble and wise? 
Nay, kind sir and madam. Queen Mary took the throne a few years later and wasn't happy with the Protestants. Ugh, too many, she said to herself. Well, if you've heard us talk about her before, she'll probably come up again time and time again because, well, she cooked those people on a wooden stake. Over her reign, countless people felt the fires of her wrath, hence the name Bloody Mary. Number 10. Girl Troubles Maria Eleonora of Brandenburg was a kind and loving mother, so long as you were a boy. Unfortunately for the royal mom, she had a great difficulty giving birth to a male heir. So when her daughter Christina was born, Maria proclaimed that she was given a dark and ugly daughter with black eyes. Eleonora often called her a monster. Oh yeah, and she did try to kill her on several occasions. Nothing says mental stability like blaming your daughter for being a daughter, and not more like a son, because the male dominated patriarchy that is royal society has no effect on this, right? Number 9. Eyes on Irene Irene was born into nobility and worked her way up the royal hierarchy. So why is Irene on this list? That's because she's probably the worst mother ever. When her son Constantine grew into adulthood, he made efforts to sideline his mother and challenge her position as a ruler. Irene, feeling some angry mom energy, retaliated in probably the worst way. In 797, Irene organized the capture of her son, and when he tried to escape, ordered that his eyes be gouged out. Constantine would later die of his injuries. Listen, I've had my fair share of minutes clocked out in the timeout corner. You can ask any one of my teachers, they'll tell you. And maybe even a few times today I should be put in the timeout corner too. But holy shit, mom, eye gouging? And that, I ain't that bad. Sheesh. Number 8. No cake for you. Marie Antoinette was the last queen of France, and for good reason. To make a long story short, she was part of the upper class nobility who benefited from the poor and overworked. When in a time of economic ruin, she still found a way to live a life of excess, while literally everyone else suffered. Spending all of France's money on completely ridiculous items, even by Lady Gaga standards, she jokingly became known as Madame Deficit. Eventually, she would be executed in the revolution. The expression, let them eat cake, was most likely not said by her or by anyone. But regardless if it was, it's a statement to show the complete disconnect and ignorance the nobility had when understanding just how bad things were for the working class. They most likely didn't care either. People were starving and putting heads on pikes. Do you really think they had time for cake, your highness? Oh, to be as beautiful and ignorant as an 18th century queen. Number seven. Lovers touch. Some couples flourish, others fizzle out. Some keep their privacy, and others like to make out in the hallways, right in front of everyone. Yeah, you know the ones. It's always by a classroom you have to walk by, or it's by your locker. Joanna of Castile leans more towards awkward locker makeouts. It's speculated that she may have had some form of mental illness. After her mother fell ill, she was reported not to be eating or sleeping, which doesn't sound that bad, actually. She was also a very envious person who oftentimes expressed her distaste for her husband's mistresses, reportedly attacking one on occasion, which again, doesn't sound that bad. And when her husband died of illness, she kept very close to the man's body and traveled over 600 kilometers with it, where he was to be buried, where she would often open the casket and embrace the cadaver and kiss him. Oh, okay, that's where the unholiness is, gotcha. I know medical knowledge wasn't great, but if your husband died of an illness, you couldn't seriously think that kissing him was a good idea. This is like the third royal I've come across that has a fixation on corpses. Sometimes you just gotta let the dead be dead, man. Number six, who are you gonna call? Queen Maria I of Portugal might have actually been insane. And no, not like, come on down to my local car dealership, these prices are insane. More like the Joker on a magic white powder that shan't be named just in case. I don't want to make you too big angry. She was known for ranting and raving, screaming that she had been damned. Perhaps it was phantoms of the night demonizing the poor soul. In attempts to cure her madness, such advanced scientific treatments like bloodletting and enemas were tried in order to cure her. The enema kind of makes sense. Maybe she's a little blocked up. It happens. I don't know. There were other attempts to cure her of her madness, but nothing seemed to work. While her first years in power were good, no one was ready for what they got afterwards. Hi, yes, uh, I'm calling from the royal court. We think the queen needs an exorcism. Mm hmm. Yeah, we tried that. Mm hmm. Uh, yeah, we tried that too. Yes, and we did try the uh, tried and true method of animal, yes. How soon can you get here? Oh, okay, perfect. Yep. Yes, I am available between the hours of 8 to 5. Mm hmm. Number 5. A2 Brute. Agrippina of Rome was like many mothers, in the sense that she would do anything for her kids. 
I'm sure every mom at home watching would scheme and slaughter their way through Roman nobility in order for her son to become emperor, right? I mean, come on, it's for the family after all. She only did it a few times, and sees the wealth of nobles which further solidified her powerful position. And her son, her beautiful baby boy Nero. How did the young lad return the favor of all this bloodthirst and treachery? Like mother, like son. Chose to fatally remove her of her power. What a nice family story right there. My mom usually just makes turkey with the stuffing, but maybe I can ask for the Roman throne this Christmas. Mom! Number 4. Revenge Boudicca was the wife of a man who had spent his time serving the Roman Empire. So when a deal was altered Darth Vader style by the Romans over what would happen to her husband's kingdom, she was pissed. Karen pissed. To be fair, she did have a point. They did unsavory and unholy things to her and her daughters. Plus, the Romans totally lied about not annexing their kingdom. Ok, so now it was time for some revenge. She gathered all the people she could and went on the attack. The Romans surprisingly did not fare that well. Boudicca was having such good luck she decided to burn London down. Of course, no civilians were harmed in the process. <laughs> I'm just kidding, a lot of people probably didn't do too well as humans can't live in fire. Sure, she was owed some revenge, but burning down a whole city? That's a lot. The Romans did eventually catch up, and she was forced to drink poison in order to avoid capture. She is remembered as somewhat of a hero to some. Number 3. Girl Power Tamar of Georgia was a woman who didn't take kindly to men questioning the rule of a woman. As you would wind up dead. She is no She is noted for having a hand in the golden age of Georgia. Funny enough, she was made a saint even though she vanquished all the orthodox clergymen at the time, for also questioning her rule. Her husband aided in conquering more land, but when he couldn't keep it in his pants, she banished him and remarried. You go girl, you commit acts of unholiness and stand up for yourself. Number 2. Serial Killer Daria Saltkova was not necessarily a queen, but she was Russian nobility. She had strong connections with the royal court and other Russian nobility. She was also very unholy. Now, Maybe you can blame it on her being widowed. Maybe she's just crazy. But her actions were sadistic. She's noted for having severely tormented her serfs and would straight up just kill them. With numbers reaching at least 138. At first, complaints about family members disappearing after working for her royal nightmare were ignored. She was just too powerful and connected. Eventually, a petition was put together and shown to Catherine the Great, where it was decided Daria would be tried publicly. She spent one hour in a public space in Moscow where people scorned her for her crimes. She was then sentenced to prison where the rest of her days were spent. She is also at times compared to Elizabeth Bathory, who committed similar non nightmare inducing crimes. Just kidding, they were an absolute nightmare. Number 1. Her Royalness Queen Elizabeth II Queen Elizabeth II may be the modern Queen of England, but that does not make her free of controversy and unholiness. If you are to believe in conspiracy theories, then perhaps old Blighty had a hand in a few things that to a normal person would be considered immoral. The death of Princess Diana immediately comes to mind, as there is some evidence to suggest the family is behind it, and her being the queen and all, it's easy to make the connection. But perhaps the most unholy crime ever committed, apparently the queen likes her sandwiches with the crust cut off. Imagine all the extra time needed to trim the crust off every sandwich. I want to talk to HR just thinking about all the extra work. But maybe you can cut the crust off of mine? Um, don't tell anyone though. Ok thanks. Number 10. Elizabeth I Good old Queen Bess is one of the most remembered queens in the British monarchy, male or female. She's a pretty big deal. Elizabeth loved to make her fellow male nobles fall under her spell. She was witty, cunning and very well liked by her court. However, one of the things that earned her some enemies was establishing a protestant England. Her sister Mary, her predecessor, fought very hard for the opposite. She was very catholic. And we will get to how bloody that was later, but Queen Bess a lot of people off, especially Spain. She was supposed to marry the Catholic Spanish king after her sister passed, but uh, she turned him down. This led to a conflict between Protestant England and Catholic Spain, but her navy defeated the Spanish Armada in 1588. Mary, Queen of Scots, laid claim to the English throne and was one of Lizzie's greatest internal threats. Mary was a Catholic, which made all the Catholics of England back her. Mary was also presumed to be behind several assassination attempts against the queen. Finally, 
finally Queen Elizabeth had to take action and after keeping her cousin hostage for 20 years, she finally had to have her executed. And we'll talk more about her later. Number 9, Catherine the Great. So Catherine the Great was called the Great for a reason. She was a pretty epic woman by most accounts. She even had one of the first vaccines, which is pretty crazy. Though she wasn't actually born in Russia or even Russian at all, Catherine was not content to go down in history quietly. She considered herself an enlightened ruler and history tends to agree with aims of prioritizing education for the people. She had many lovers and there is enough evidence to suggest that the son she had was illegitimate. Peter III of Russia was hardly the man Catherine intended on marrying, and later planned a coup against him which resulted in her position of power. However, the coup did turn bloody when on July 17th, Peter died under mysterious circumstances. There isn't proof that she was directly involved or even knew about it, but it cast a dark shadow over her reign for the rest of the time. Number 8, Grace O'Malley. We've got enough traditional royalty on this list that we definitely need to spice it up. Enter Grace O'Malley, the Pirate Queen of Ireland. Pirate Queen, what a title. Definitely considered unholy behavior, Grace abandoned the traditions of women of the time and fled to the sea. There she took on the waves and perils of Davy Jones Locker with a legendary ferocity. She was born into the clan O'Malley around 1530 around the time of Henry VIII's rule over England and Ireland. Clan O'Malley was a notorious seafaring clan and ruled the southern shore of Clew Bay, Aquiland, and most of the barony of Murrisk for over 300 years. Grace was really well educated and could even converse fully in Latin, Spanish, Scottish, Gaelic, and French. She was not one to be refused and after spending years fighting the British, she finally met Queen Bess and not only did she speak Latin to her, but she refused used to bow as she was considered a queen herself by that point. Number 7, Mary Queen of Scots. I told you I was going to bring her up. A name you will recognize as I've already mentioned her before, but in terms of who the villain in that story is, it depends on which side you're telling the story on. Mary's story is full of tragedy, romance, betrayal, loss, and heartbreak. Unlike Lizzie, Mary was a dedicated Catholic and spent the entirety of her reign trying to gather the Catholics against Elizabeth. She had a series of marriages and relationships that led to tragedy every which way she went. Her first husband, the Dauphin of France, died shortly after their marriage. Her second husband she loved until he became a drunkard and then she just started running things. But he was mysteriously unalive while she was six months pregnant. He was inside a building that exploded but his body landed outside and it turned out he was strangled. So what happened there? She would later give birth to two stillborn sons but she would have sons later on. She would have a son who would inherit the throne after Elizabeth's death but it was due to Mary's plotting and scheming that eventually ended her in death. So she did actually plot to kill Elizabeth. So that's a pretty unholy deed, I would say. Number six. Princess Olga of Kiev. Okay, wow, this woman. One saint you definitely don't want to mess with. Despite being a saint, Princess Olga of Kiev was actually pretty sinful. She was one of the most vicious and vengeful rulers in the history of Kievan Rus, which would later become Russia, Ukraine, and Belarus. Olga took center stage after her husband died and made sure she would never be forgotten. Her husband died in a very gruesome way by the enemies that we're going to talk about in a second. When the people who viciously unalived her husband tried to persuade her to marry their leader, they sent 20 men. Olga told them to wait in their boats, had her men dig a ditch in the meantime, and the next morning buried the men alive. She then lied and told the king she would accept his offer if he sent his best company to retrieve her. He didn't know about all that stuff yet. When they got there, she locked them in a bathhouse and torched it. But it didn't stop there. Olga didn't stop there. That's not her style. She would later host a steak dinner with her enemies in which they were staked. Very Vlad the Impaler, I know. Then she set whole villages on fire by attaching sulfur to pigeons and then it was just crazy. Damn, like hell has no fury like a woman scorned, let me tell you. Number five, Queen Isabella the First. The Spanish Inquisition, pretty high up there as far as terrifying points in history go. If you weren't willing to convert to Catholicism, you were tormented, interrogated, and burned at the stake. Who was behind this awful time in history? This lady, Queen Isabella the First. Technically, as she was fighting for a holy order for the Catholic Church, this can be seen as holy, but was it? Burning people at the stake because they didn't share this belief? Ah, not cool, Isabel. She created a secular government through her reign, which allowed for the monarchy to have more power. Being a pious Catholic, she made Catholicism the official religion and created a tribunal to make this happen. Secret service or a secret police that spread fear wherever they went. Her direct influence caused the Jewish population to falter for a really long time after. Number four, Friedegan of Soissons. Okay, I maybe said that wrong, so I apologize. Kind of impressed with her rise to power. She went from slave attendant 
to queen. How do you bridge that gap? No idea. Boy was she ferocious. Assassination and manipulation were her main political tools. Fritigan was among a small number of enslaved women in the Merovingian household that became a queen. Merovingian was the OG Central Europe before everything got split up. She survived political dangers and retained her husband's loyalty and could persuade monks and priests to jump onto her plots with ease. She encouraged her husband, the king, to set aside his first wife and then even take the life of his second. But his second wife, Galswinda, had a sister named Brunhild who became the mortal enemy of Fredegund. She had good reason to be. Fredegund continued to do everything she could to secure her position, one assassination after the next. She was a pretty stormy lady. Number 3, Bathory. Okay, okay, okay. All right. Technically not a queen. I get it. But she might as well have been with the power that she had. So fight me. She's remembered as the most evil woman in the world in history, I think. I don't know. That's my opinion. Bathory was the stuff of nightmares. Elizabeth Bathory was born on August 7th, 1560 into a prominent Hungarian noble family, making her practically untouchable. She married a very famous war hero who is suspected of gifting Bloody Lizzie with the skills she used to kill. After she died, Bathory became obsessed with immortality. Supposedly when one of her servants accidentally spilt blood on her and her skin appeared younger after. Bathory then began her mission of horror, luring over 650 young virgin women to her palace and brutally taking their lives. She was even bold enough to lure daughters of nobility. Before draining them of their blood, she would make them suffer in ways you don't even want to imagine before bathing in the blood itself. When she was finally caught, three of her servants were executed but she was simply locked away in her tower for the rest of her days on house arrest. Ugh. Number 2, Catherine de Medici, also known as the Serpent Queen. History colors her story as the tale of the evil queen. On one hand, she is remembered for being one of the most powerful French queens in history, and then on the other, she was blamed for the many atrocities that took place during her reign. Her regency was marked by the French wars of religion and the many games Catherine played within them. The Catholics and the Protestants, as previously mentioned, were at war, and she spent a lot of time trying to find peace. Kind of. But she was a passionate Catholic and is believed to have tried to remove a Protestant general from her son's side. When he survived the attack, she lied and convinced her son that the Protestants were responsible so she scapegoated them. So he authorized taking the lives of their leaders. Enter St. Bartholomew's Massacre. Catherine implicated the general which resulted in him being the first to be beaten and then tossed out of his own bedroom window. An estimated 3,000 French Protestants were taken out in Paris, but the total countrywide was around 70,000. And last but not least, Bloody Mary, actually known as Queen Mary the First of England. So no, I'm not talking about the girl you say in the mirror three times so that she appears and you're like, wow, I'm haunted forever. Queen Mary became known as Bloody Mary due to her vicious tirade against Protestants in England during her reign. She even imprisoned her own sister, Elizabeth, who we mentioned at the beginning of this list, due to suspicions of treason. This was unfounded. She bore her father Henry VIII ill will after the stuff he pulled with the church and after having he legitimized her as his heir for a time. After Mary took the throne and married the Catholic King of Spain, she began carrying out her plan for England to become Catholic once again. In 1555, she revived England's heresy laws and began burning offenders at the stake, starting with her father's longtime advisor, Thomas Kramer, the Archbishop of Canterbury. She burned over 300 convicted heretics, most of them being common citizens, and dozens more died in prison, hence giving her the name of Bloody Mary. Kicking off the list at number 10, Heart of Glass. Alexandria of Bavaria, the royal who believed she had swallowed a grand piano made of glass. I'm not joking, yeah, she was a princess, so not technically a queen, but this is so insane that I had to kick off this list with it. The 23-year-old Bavarian princess was quite the scholar. She was known to enjoy literature, but she equally put energy into convincing those around her that she'd swallowed a piano made entirely of glass when she was a wee child. She grew up afraid that her inner piano would shatter. We have an inner demon, she has an inner piano made of glass. So she would enter rooms slowly and sideways, I'm not kidding, to, you know, avoid cracking that personal piano problem. Just like King Charles VI, he thought he was going to break at any given moment. Saying you were made of glass was quite an uncommon delusion. The victims were more often than not royalty. They had glass. They watched this fancy material shatter in their hands all the time. No wonder, it probably scared them. There's actually a play on this glass delusion. It's called The Glass Piano by Alex Sobler. Quite recent too. Apparently, it's a blast. Check it out if you 
have the chance. We love that. Keep writing plays about glass pianos. This is insane. At number nine, Rosemary's Baby. Back in the days of old, it was very important to the monarchy to have a male heir. Many kings throughout history have been known to get very upset when they weren't given a son to inherit the throne, and they put a lot of pressure on their wives to give them a boy. Why? I don't know. Boys kind of stuck. Anyway, this probably drove a lot of people crazy, but there is at least one confirmed case of crazy baby fever from Maria Eleonora. She kept trying to have a baby, but when she finally got pregnant, everyone was hoping for a boy. Unfortunately, the odds weren't in her favor, and she gave birth to a little girl instead. People knew that Maria would get absolutely triggered upon learning of her baby's gender, so they kept it a secret from her as long as they could, but eventually they had to tell her, and Maria was pissed. She really went looking for that receipt to return that baby and get a refund or at least a store credit. When she found out the baby was a girl, the queen reacted by saying, quote, Instead of a son, I am given a daughter, dark and ugly, with a great nose and black eyes. Take her from me, I will not have such a monster. End quote. Like damn, tell her how you really feel. After that, mysterious things started happening to this baby, like a wooden beam mysteriously falling into the baby's crib, and somehow accidentally falling down the stairs. Even even the nurse once dropped the poor kid onto the stone floor. Like, I get it. You're disappointed, but that's still your kid, and a lot of people aren't given that privilege, so be grateful for your spawn. Number eight, dirty talk. Going back to the 15th century to Queen Isabella of Spain, now, it's not uncommon for queens to brag, be it about their wealth, status, their mans, you name it. But to brag that you've only bathed twice in your life, that's a bit odd. What's the deal with this? Okay, well back in 537 AD, Rome had 11 aqueducts that ran over about a thousand public fountains, okay? Over 900 bathhouses included. It was quite important, but when invading Goths cut them off, the Catholic Church literally had no idea how to fix the problem. So instead, they just told everybody that bathing was a sin only practiced by pagans. So at one point in history, you could have ran a bath, thrown in a bath bomb, relaxed for an hour, got out, and then immediately, you're a sinner. Worst of the worst, too. How dare you have a bath on Monday afternoon, you monster, you pagan monster. The Old Spice guy would have rocked their world. At number seven, Mother Knows Best. I think after hearing about these queens who've done some dark things to get their way, you would think that it's safe to say you don't mess with a woman and her plight for power. Unless you want to end up six feet under, that is. One Roman Empress, Julia Agrippina of Rome, was pretty spoiled already. She lived a lavish life, her husband was the emperor, and she had a family. But that just wasn't enough for her, and she wanted it all. Julia was quite ambitious, and she spent most of her early life trying to dethrone her predecessors. She believed that she and her son had a claim to the Roman throne by birthright, and so she bamboozled her way into royalty by tricking her uncle Claudius into changing Roman law so that they could get married. Ew. Suddenly though, after they got married and she became empress, Claudius died and most people think that Julia had something to do with it. That's likely the case. She and her son Nero went on to rule Rome from 49 to 54 CE. Julia stayed by her son's side for as long as she could so that she could hold on to her power, but eventually Nero got tired of his mother manipulating him and he had her forced out of power. Julia, as you can imagine, was furious because power was the one thing in the world that she desired most. and so she rallied a group of supporters to try and overthrow her son, but the plans backfired and she was expelled instead. Talk about ambition getting the best of you. Number six, we are family. The last queen of Madagascar, Queen Rana Valona, was one of the worst. She was born in 1788 and she ruled over the kingdom for 33 years. She was so cruel and violent that she would often choose violence first in order to preserve independence over the island. She's known as the most ruthless queen in history. After the death of her husband, she just went mad with that new power. In the late 1700s, her king brought peace to the land, but of course there were traditionalists who opposed him. The king's uncle at one point tried to take him out, but a local warned the king. That king repaid the local by adopting his daughter, Rana Valona, to marry his son, Prince Radama. Now, when her prince was alive, they didn't get along at all. And then come 1810, the king passed away, giving Rana Lova the promotion of a lifetime. It's also theorized that she poisoned him too, so that's... Horrible. Ranalova kept away the advances of the French and the British and left bodies of those who tried to attack out for display on the beach. Lovely, like bobbleheads. In 1845, Queen Rana Valona ordered 50,000 subjects to build roads across the jungle for four months straight for this massive buffalo hunt. Well, 10,000 of those poor souls died of starvation and exhaustion, and also not one buffalo was hunted. 
nor seen. Great plan. At number five, Queen Batman. Batman, he is justice. We know this. Well, long before Batman, there was a queen who sought vengeance and she did it in the most brutal way. Olga of Kiev became queen regent in 945 CE after her husband was killed because her son was just too young to rule yet. Olga knew that once her son was old enough to be crowned king, her power would be taken away, so she had to do the most that she could with her power while it still lasted, and so she used her powers as monarch to seek justice for her husband's death. She was able to get her husband's killers captured and killed using scolding water, but she soon developed a thirst for suffering apparently and she just kept on going after people. She would not rest until everyone associated with the people who killed her husband were all eliminated. So if you ever breathe in the general vicinity of the guy who offed her hubby, you could kiss your life goodbye. Olga took hundreds of people out of the tribe that her killers were from, she devised a plan to bury their tribe's leaders alive, and she even came up with a plan to set fire to their entire village. It is said that Olga may have locked the tribe's leaders in a bathhouse and burned it down, but we don't know for sure. All we know is that she definitely was not okay. Number four, no crust. This next one, honestly, I stand by. I see no wrong here. Queen Elizabeth II, still rocking to this day, she's been known for a few funny, quirky queen things. Like one of my favorites, for example, she has somebody on payroll who breaks in new shoes for the queen. Every time I buy Vans, my ankle always does that little foot rub. If only I were a queen, damn it. But we're talking about unusual things here. And one of the weirdest things I've ever heard is that the queen has refused crust on her sandwiches. This has been a no-go for about 150 years. It's not recent at all. You might be thinking, oh, maybe she's old. She can't chew her jawbones. Nope way back. This goes way back for no reason. Right around the time of Queen Victoria and her husband Albert, they viewed anything square shaped as bad luck because it looked like a coffin. I've never thought about death while eating grilled cheese, but now I definitely will. Thank you. This must be a pretty scary job, cutting the crust off the queen's bread. My hands would be shaking the entire time. Also, diagonal or down the middle? Let us know. There's only one right answer. At number three, Evil Empress. This next empress is pretty similar to Olga of Kiev, whom I talked about earlier. Empress Wu Zetan also had a thirst for blood and suffering, but not towards people who have necessarily wronged her. You see, when she came into power, she was determined to keep that power by any means necessary. So she had all of her rivals killed. So anyone who could possibly overthrow her or come for her seat on the throne was eliminated. The empress ordered the execution of the previous empress, as well as members of her own family, including her own newborn daughter. She didn't want to risk anyone taking away her power, including her own offspring apparently. She didn't hold back on the methods of eliminating her rivals either. Yeah sure, she could have just done a one two stabby stabby and called it a day, but that's no fun. Instead, she had people poisoned, strangled, mutilated, or even burned or boiled alive good soup. Eventually, she retired from her part-time job of sending people back to their maker and started spending more time with her lovers and getting addicted to aphrodisiacs. People weren't quick to forget about all that bloodshed though, and so to get back at her, they had all of her lovers killed and the empress was exiled. She got a little too greedy and karma came back with a vengeance. Number two, Ice Palace. If you're a fan of the film Frozen, this next one is gonna get you jazzed right up. Anna Ivanova, the Empress of Russia from 1730 to 1740. Okay, so in celebration over their victory with the Ottoman Empire, Anna gave the order to build an ice house, this massive ice palace. Best place to cool down if you ask me, I'll leave. This ice palace was pretty impressive. If I was there, I would 100% lick the walls. Obviously, someone definitely did, you know that for a fact. 20 meters by 50 meters, and even more impressive, there were ice trees and ice birds sculpted inside. How magical is that? Anna arranged this marriage with a prince and one of her maids. Now, they didn't know each other, they were forced to ride an elephant, and all the guests were dressed up like clowns. Yep, that's all valid, that's all accurate. You heard me. You may be thinking, wait a minute, Taylor, an ice palace in Russia, was that maybe Cold? Yeah, it was an absolute nightmare. Anna made the guest party all night, freezing cold. They all got sick, dressed like clowns. I went to an ice hotel in Quebec once. Spoiler alert, it's cold and boring. There, I just saved you $70. You're welcome. And finally, at number one, Gladiator Games and Chill. If you didn't ever have to go to work and you could just lounge around all day, 
what would you do with your time? Really, anything could be possible. You could be like the Bruno Mars lazy song. Well, there's one empress from back in ancient Rome who occupied her time with the company of others. Apparently, Empress Valeria Messalina was famous for her exploits. Since she was empress and she had all this time and money and no one to tell her no, she took full advantage of that and bought a house, turned it into a brothel, and made that her side hustle. A lot like Littlefinger from Game of Thrones. Though she had a collection of women who worked there, she also was known to invite upper class ladies to participate in the nightly escapades as well. And don't think that Valeria did jump in as well. She was considered to be quite something in the sack. In the wise words of Ludacris and Little John, she was a lady in the streets, but a freak in the bed. <laughs> The Empress was known to be such a hardcore participant that she would win games where they would compete to sleep with the most men in one night. One time she won the round after being with 25 men. One night. She did the absolute most, but at least she was having fun. At number 10, blinded by ambition. I don't know about you, but I think my favorite part of these queens list is learning about all the wild and crazy things that queens did to keep or acquire power back in the days of old. Like these gals were absolutely ruthless and they weren't afraid to absolutely body anyone who stood in their way. We've heard about queens taking out enemy tribes, their husbands, and even their own family members. This all sounds like a round of Call of Duty when you're the last one on your team and you're just murking everyone in sight trying to save your own skin. Let's talk about a queen, or rather empress, who was so desperate for power that she ended up killing her own son. Irene of Athens was an empress from the Byzantine Empire who ruled from 797 to 802 CE. She started her reign as co-ruler alongside her son, Emperor Constantine IV. Though it started as a good old family business, you know, saving people, hunting things, not really. Things went south as they normally did back then. Irene wanted all the power to herself and so she sought out to eliminate her competition, her own son. Irene lured her son into the very room that he was born in and gouged his eyes out. Like ma'am, this is not ice cream. You can't just scoop eyeballs out and make a sundae out of them. Thank you. That's not how that works. <laughs> Constantine ended up dying as a result of his injuries and since his own heir had passed away earlier that year, the transition of power ended up going to Irene who became emperor. Yes, emperor, not empress, because she was the sole ruler, making her the first woman to do so. Number nine, topless duels. Yeah, you heard me. Hungarian princess Pauline von Metternich was married to Prince Clemens, but she was born in 1836 and she had to marry her uncle when she was 20 years old. So surprise, surprise, she was unhappy. Who knew? Weird, right? Since the marriage began, her husband was involved in numerous affairs. He liked going after actresses or singers, anyone glamorous or hot or cool. He barely paid any attention to her. That is until, you know, she started to have fun, live a life maybe. Yeah, once she got over this gross prince, she had a great time. She drank, she smoked, she partied, she defined convention, but most notably, her duel in the summer of 1892. She challenged another royal, a countess of the matter, to a duel and nothing but a corset. Now to this day, it's not yet determined who exactly won this duel, this corset poke off. But a princess dueling in the dark after some drinks, that should be a musical, not Frozen. Get out of here. At number eight, no side bays. A bad relationship can really mess you up. Anyone who's been through a bad breakup can tell you that. Not as many people carry that pain with them as much as Catherine de Medici did back in the day. Hurt didn't even begin to describe how she felt and she really embodied the pain that she was feeling after having her heart broken. She basically turned into the type of person that was like, if I'm not happy, no one else is gonna be happy either. Catherine's husband, Henry II of France, had a mistress and Catherine was well aware of it. They had been having an affair for basically the whole time Catherine was married to Henry and he loved his mistress more than he ever loved his wife. When Henry was on his deathbed, his final request was to see his mistress one last time and as a final F you to her husband, not only did she deny the mistress from visiting Henry, but she literally made him die alone with no one by his side when he kicked the bucket. On top of this hatred towards her husband though, Catherine Catherine was also an absolute B word to her daughter as well. Catherine would fight her daughter over her romantic affairs. I guess she didn't want her daughter to be like her father. Either way, Catherine got so mad about one of her daughter's affairs that when she found out about her lover, she locked her daughter away in a castle and never saw her again. Talk about a serious grudge. Number seven. 
two for one. When you're deemed the most beautiful woman in all the realm of England and the most loving, well, odds are you're going to need two husbands. All that love to give, it only makes sense. Joan of Kent was named as such, and at the age 12, so gross, she was married for the first time. She fell in love with a knight named Thomas Holland. Yeah, she dated Tom Holland, the knight Spider-Man guy, that's great. He was 26 and she was 12, still gross, but they got married in secret. She knew her parents wouldn't be on board, he was broke, and yeah, he was also 26, so for obvious reasons, it had to be a little hush-hush. Even in royal standards, that's a bit odd. After the wedding, Thomas had to go off to war, and he wasn't gone for too long before, well, she remarried. The son of the Earl of Salisbury slid into her DMs, and Joan thought Tom Holland's Spider Knight was dead. Well, Thomas returned, like he did in Endgame, but they were legal issues now. Ultimately, Joan and Thomas got together and had four children, but after Thomas did die, Joan became the first ever Princess of Wales. So if you love someone, just, you know, marry them. Even if the other person's still just over there, just marry them both, see what happens. At number six, apple of his eye. I feel like this queen I'm about to tell you about needs to have her own movie made about her or something because the things she did for power were almost unbelievable. I would say that I would want to be her when I grow up, but she's kind of responsible for the deaths of a lot of people, and that's not really something I'm striving for, you know? But she did have a lot of determination. I will give her that. Isabella was married to King Edward II of England, and though she was quite the catch, Isabella wasn't really all that jazzed about him. She was like, meh, I guess I'll be your wife, even though back then she really wouldn't have a choice in the matter anyway. Anyways, after 10 years of marriage and the birth of an heir, things seemed to be relatively okay between the king and queen. That is, until the king started getting all buddy-buddy with his friend Hugh Dispenser, who was a much hated noble. Very hated. Hated numero uno. Isabella didn't like the bromance that was forming and she was like, uh, no, the only person who gets the king's attention is me. So she rallied the support of the other nobles, banished the Dispenser family, burned their castles to the ground, claimed their possessions, and killed anyone who supported the disgraced family. After all of that went down, she took refuge in the Tower of London, where she met a prisoner whom she smuggled to France. Then she got her husband to bring their son to France. And from there, with the support of the nobles and the common people, she was able to defeat her husband and the dispensers and became queen regent until her son Edward III came of age to become king. After all of that, she finally got her way. I hope she slept well that night because she did the most. Number five, rebel princess. Princess Leia wasn't the only rebel, okay? Princess Margaret partied with rock stars during the 60s. The queen's younger sister was known as the rebel princess. She was seen for years and years as this, well, bad. She passed away in 2002, but even to this day, we're trying to piece together her love life. Pablo Picasso actually wanted to marry her at one point. How fun is that? Also, side note, I didn't realize how recent Pablo Picasso died. That was alarming to find out. Guess my whole life's a lie. Her wedding was the first to be aired on TV. That's quite a big deal. The first televised royal wedding took place on May 6, 1960. In 1968, just eight years after, word had spread that the princess had an affair at a nightclub with pianist Robin Douglas Holm, who only a year and a half later took his own life. Adds a lot of mystery there. Then come 1973, the paparazzi got photos of her with a landscape gardener on her private island. One of the more unusual facts surrounding Princess Margaret was that she was cremated, believe it or not. She had chosen to break tradition so that her ashes could be shared in the same tomb as her father. How sweet is that? These acts are unusual when it comes to royalty, but Margaret also supported more than 80 charity organizations. But even then, media still focused on her love life. Classic. Keep it up. At number four, Warrior Queen. Let's talk about Queen Rainy Lakshmi Bai and how she became known as India's Joan of Arc. Rainy was a fighter her whole life. She was raised to be a warrior and was taught how to fight. She even shared her skills with other women, teaching them the same fighting skills at a young age. She was married off to a much older man and she had a child, but she lost them both pretty early on. In need of an heir, she adopted a son and served as queen regent, but soon a growing conflict started causing a lot of tension between the British East Indian Company and her people. The young queen, at just 22 years old, wanted to drive British forces out of her land, and so she organized a revolt that turned bloody very quickly. She ordered the execution of literally every British person in the region. So Bobby from down the street, dead. Mary from around the block, goner. Freddie and Harriet, the kids of that guy that you know who bought shoes off your brother, bye bye. Gone. Rainy killed every man, woman, and child in the area. But it still wasn't enough to win against the British. The Queen died on the battlefield, and the British ended up winning the battle, and the kingdom fell to the enemy forces. This Queen was one of the bravest and most determined women in history, and she's still remembered as a hero. Number three, Chelonis. 
The reason we look at princesses like Margaret and say she was a rebel is because most of the time these marriages are chosen. Well, rather, women are forced to marry some gross fat dudes. And while he's cheating and eating lobster, the wife has to have his kids and be dutiful. So for the Spartan princess from the third century, she too was forced to marry Cleonymus, this older, horrible man. He was so horrible that he wasn't even allowed to have his father's throne. That's how bad he was. He was in the family and still they're like, no. So Chalones thought, this guy sucks, the system sucks, I'm gonna go talk to the much more pleasant Archytatus, son of King Eris I. Around 272 BC, both these guys, both her lovers, went to war with each other. Mm, drama. How about the tea on that? Chalonis was preparing to hang herself in case her husband won. That's horrible. Now, luckily, he lost, therefore the princess this time around did really live happily ever after with her other man. That's like an R-rated version of Shrek 2, what I just said. I can't believe people had to go through this in real life. That's horrible. At number two, toxic cosmetics. The price of beauty is pretty steep. These days, people spend hundreds and hundreds of dollars on makeup to make themselves feel beautiful. But back in the day, makeup not only cost a pretty penny, but it also cost some serious health concerns. Cosmetics were made of a lot of questionable ingredients that you probably wouldn't find in today's products, but for people like Queen Elizabeth I, she didn't care what she was putting on her skin, so long as she not only looked like a snack, but the whole damn meal. Yeah. Elizabeth had pitting in her skin from when she contracted smallpox at the age of 29, and back then, having blemished skin was a sign that God was a little cheesed with you. Or that you were having some wild thoughts like thinking about the sexy time uwu. It was thought that these thoughts bubbled up from your no-no square up to your face and showed everyone that you were sinning. Anyways, to cover up the blemishes, Elizabeth wore a lot of makeup, like her version of foundation, but the ingredients were really just making things worse and not better. The foundation was made with a tincture of white lead ore, vinegar, and sometimes arsenic, hydroxide, and carbonate. To add some color back to her face after applying this pasty white mask, she powdered cinnabar to her lips and cheeks, but this was pretty dangerous because it contained mercury. She did this every day, and as you can imagine, it wasn't good for her health at all. Imagine absorbing all of those chemicals through your face on a daily basis. Not cute. And finally, number one. Are you not entertained? Back in the late 1800s, the name Clara Ward would stir up a conversation. She was famous, really famous, for all the wrong reasons, of course. All it took was her bumping into a European royal and Bob's your uncle. Since birth, Clara was born into money. She didn't even need a royal husband. She was born into a wealthy industrialist family. She would sometimes visit the family mills, you know, to make it look good and kind of be like, hey, how's everyone doing? Whatever, just a casual visit. But on this one casual visit, she crossed paths with the Prince of Caraman Chime. He was there for trade, but when he left, he brought back a wife. Carry on, also, meet my wife. Here she is. People were freaking out, obviously. A royal marrying a common American girl. Wow, how could you? She was the talk of the town. Unlike Meghan Markle, Clara loved to show off with her newfound wealth. Some loved her and her image, but others, not so much. The marriage only lasted six years. Clara eloped with a Hungarian musician. Then after her divorce, she had to model to make a living rather than showing off for clout. At number 10, kleptomania. If you were a queen, then you would think that you had enough money to just buy whatever your little heart desired. Though that may be true, there was at least one famous queen who just straight up stole things just because she could. Queen Mary, Queen Elizabeth's grandmother, was quite the kleptomaniac, and no matter how hard people tried to avoid having their things stolen by her, it just never worked. When the queen would visit someone's house, she would walk around looking at whatever knickknacks you had lying around, and when she found something that she liked, she would stand there and just sigh super loudly to get someone's attention. Much like how my dog used to sigh dramatically when he wanted food. Anyways, usually when someone heard the sigh, they knew that this was a sign that the queen wanted whatever she was gazing upon. Sometimes the homeowner would just give whatever it was to the queen as a gift, gift, but if it was something that they weren't willing to part with, then she would either try to buy it off them or just straight up take it when no one was looking. This became such a big problem that people started hiding their prized possessions before hosting the queen in their home, but she eventually caught on to this strategy, so she just started showing up uninvited. She could not rest until she owned pretty much everything in the kingdom. Number nine, no time to dine. If I'm eating, don't acknowledge me as a human being. I sound like a pug when I eat, okay? I don't waste any time. I love food, okay? It's business. Now, if you're a queen and you eat fast, well, everybody else has to eat fast as well. This began back in Queen Victoria's time. The queen loved to feast and she didn't waste any time at all. Like, 
it's really fast. The way the royal family works is that when the queen is done that course or that meal, you're also done. So when Queen Victoria would smash an entire seven course meal in 30 minutes, which apparently she could do easily, you'd be blowing on your soup still and Queen Victoria would already be telling everybody to pack it up. That's stressful. All because she could eat lots of food in a short amount of time. Also, once the queen gave a toast, you couldn't even speak. Also, once the queen placed her cutlery on the table, regardless of where you were during that course, everybody's plate would then be taken away at the same time. And the next one would then come in. I would just put my food in my pockets, you know? Screw it. It's almost like when you go to all you can eat sushi and you have like some sushi left over, you don't wanna waste it. You're like, you know what? I'm not paying that bill. At number eight, cross-dressing. Empress Elizabeth was quite the character, I guess you could say. Since she was a monarch, she could do whatever she wanted, and that is exactly what she did. You see, she was quite into fashion, more specifically, men's fashion. The Empress believed that she just had legs for days, like Naomi Campbell, and she wanted to show them off to the world, but the only problem with that was the fact that back then, pants were reserved for men, and so since she wore dresses all the time, no one got to see her godly legs. Well, to combat that, Elizabeth came up with a solution. She was known to hold huge parties where everyone had to cross-dress. She only did this so that it would give her an excuse to wear pants. And I mean, she could have if she just wanted to wear them on a regular day, but she didn't want to be the only woman in men's clothing, so she made everyone else dress up too. At these parties, no one looked good or really enjoyed themselves for that matter. Women complained that the men's clothing they wore to these parties were unflattering, and the men were just all over the place because they didn't know how to maneuver a hoop skirt. The only person really having a fun time was Empress Elizabeth, but I guess that was really the whole point. Number seven, check on the dead. Funerals are pretty expensive, especially a royal one at that. It takes a lot of power to dig up and then carry these massive caskets around, which back in the day was even more exhausting. Joanna of Castile was born in 1479. Her marriage to the Duke of Austria was arranged, but she was very much in love, maybe a bit too much. Hear me out. When her husband met his fate in 1506 due to typhoid fever, Joanna would have his tomb unearthed and then opened over and over again, just so she could make sure that he was still there. Now, of course, I feel bad for the queen here. She was clearly not coping with his death well, but to have his tomb or casket or coffin, whatever you want to call it, to have it opened and closed over and over and then dug up and then put back in the ground, she would make people carry his body around everywhere she went. That's heavy, that is so much work, even keeping it under her bed sometimes. Ugh, I got goosebumps just saying that. That's pretty creepy. Ashes, I could understand. That's like a one-man job to carry that around. But a thousand pound royal coffin that you have to carry 30 city blocks? My back already hurts thinking of that. No thank you, I quit. At number six, deadly affairs. Dating is hard. If you've ever been on dating apps like Tinder or Bumble, then you know that things aren't as easy as it may seem when it comes to finding someone that you remotely like. Maybe we should take a page out of Queen Nzinga's book when it comes to dating because it seemed like she had fun with her escapades. Well, maybe don't actually do what she did because it's actually pretty gruesome, but you get what I'm saying. Queen Nzinga from what is now modern day Angola was a busy woman. After taking over the throne from her brother, she juggled the monarchy, wars with the Portuguese, and having a love life. The queen pulled together a harem of only the most attractive men, but because she was such a busy person, she didn't really have the time to walk into a room and choose who she was going to sleep with that night, so she came up with an alternative solution. Nzinga would have two members of her harem fight each other to the death, every night, and whoever won got to sleep with the queen. Solid plan, right? Well, the winner wasn't really all that lucky for too long because she would have the winner executed the following day. Number five, diamond scandals. Queen Mary wasn't the only queen with sticky fingers, it seems. The affair of the diamond necklace has sparked many conversations. France's queen from 1774 to 1792 was Marie Antoinette, and if that name sounds familiar to you, it's because she was the last queen before the French Revolution. She was also known for spending a buck on jewelry. She liked she liked the diamonds. Now this Countess de Lamotte was this young lady, a friend of the queen, supposedly, who entered the French court in 1785. Now she got somebody to disguise herself as the queen and then she acted like she was in love with this high society member, all to get her hands on this $12 million necklace. Now she said that she would pay, but never ended up paying a dime, so that's horrible by itself. And the queen supposedly had no idea about 
any of this or what happened to the necklace. Although this countess pretended to be her friend beforehand. The public went on to hate her for this, not believing in the scandal of course. One of the most notable lines from Marie Antoinette was when the French spoke out for not being able to afford bread. She apparently said, well let them eat cake which led into the French Revolution and ultimately her demise. Shine bright like a diamond, I guess. At number four, test drives. Catherine the Great of Russia was well known for a number of things. She was known for being a good leader, a strong ruler, and surprisingly for her naughty bedroom fun times as well. She was well known for her adventures in baby making, and there was once a rumor that she did the deed with a horse. Obviously that wasn't actually true, however she did do it with a lot of men. The only problem that she really faced when it came to finding a new partner was actually having the time to do so. I mean, it's not like she could swipe through Tinder while sitting on her throne, right? What was most important to her was finding a new lover who was skilled in the sack and she didn't really want to waste time on testing these guys out, so she had someone else do it for her. Catherine had a friend take her potential partner out on a test drive, so to speak, so that she wasn't wasting her time on someone who couldn't meet her standards. Remember, she is a very busy woman. It is said that on a couple of occasions, Catherine's tester friend was caught in bed with Catherine's partner again well after the Empress was with him and that made things a little complicated. But I imagine that they got past that. Or at least I really hope they did. Number three, change religion. Ruling alongside the pharaoh Akhenaten from 1353 to 1336, Queen Nefertiti aka Lady of Grace aka the Lost Queen of Egypt was only 15 years old when she married 16 year old Akhenaten. Now alongside her new young husband she built an entirely new capital city called Amarna and ruled over what's now considered the wealthiest period in ancient Egyptian history. But when it comes to spoiled queens or rather queens who could do anything they believe with their power we have to mention the queen that changed Egypt religion. Both her and her co-ruler were in a cult, the cult of the sun god, Aton. In the earliest accounts of the queen, she assisted her husband in a ritual that smited the female enemies of Egypt at the time, and there have been a few blocks that have since been recovered from the Thibian tombs of the royal butler that depicts the queen wearing her unique blue crown, part of the sun god rituals. So now cut to the end of the king's ruling, the Aton was now Egypt's main god. Some queens change laws, others change religion. At number two, fake village. Imagine being so privileged and so disconnected from the world that you pretend to be poor for fun. Well, that's pretty much what Marie Antoinette did. This French queen was known for her lavish and opulent lifestyle and that's really the only life that she knew. Apparently, living the life of a rich queen started to get a little boring for her and she wanted to find an escape and so she got her people to build a fake village for her so that she could pretend to be a commoner. This fake village included 11 cottages, a lake, a water mill, a working dairy, a windmill, a barn, and other quote unquote peasant buildings. Maria apparently loved this little peasant village and she would bring other people to enjoy it too. When she brought her guests to the village, she expected them to yes and their way through the day and really immerse themselves into their role of a common person. She would even tell her ladies to ditch the ball gowns and wear something simple to blend in. Marie even took her kids to the fake village to teach them about farming. Even though she loved her pretend peasant lifestyle, it still didn't help her bond with the real common people and it certainly didn't save her from the guillotine. And finally coming in at a number one spot, surprise entrance. The last true pharaoh of Egypt, Cleopatra VII ruled from 69 to 30 BC. She's known mainly for her love interests, of course, her two mans, Mark Anthony and Julius Caesar. And to this day, we're still trying to uncover more dazzling details of the lost queen. Now, she ruled alongside her young brother, and her life was much more than being just beautiful, which is what everyone seems to focus on more than anything. Both children were assigned to the throne, Cleopatra being 18 and little bro being 10 years old. So Cleopatra, being a little older, therefore a little wiser, became the ruler. A couple of years passed and eventually Cleopatra was pushed out of Alexandria over her greed for power, classic, but her little brother, equally a co-ruler, had her driven out. He was jealous and honestly, I'm the youngest in my family, I kinda get it. But Cleopatra wasn't quite done yet, she had a few tricks up her sleeve. Believing she was the goddess Isis reborn, this beautiful goddess, Cleopatra made these dazzling entrances whenever she could. Most notably in 48 BC, right when Caesar arrived in Alexandria during that family feud with Ptolemy VIII. She wanted to meet the Roman general, but she couldn't be seen because it was a little bit of family beef, so she had herself wrapped up in a linen sack and then personally delivered to Caesar's bedroom. Hashtag your order has arrived. 
Surprise. Now she won the heart of Rome's future dictator here, obviously, and eventually she regained Egypt's throne. Her brother wasn't too fond of this alliance, and in the following battle, he drowned in the Nile River, resulting in Cleopatra's return to power. Kicking off the list at number 10, the Empress of Austria. The saying wrong place at the wrong time couldn't be used more in this case. Empress Elizabeth of Austria, she was sadly taken out by somebody who just wanted to attack a royal. He didn't have anything against Elizabeth per se, this man was an Italian anarchist named Luigi Luceni, and that fateful day, September 10th, 1898, he took the Empress's life. In his own admission, Luigi stated that he had nothing against the Empress on a personal level at all. So what had happened was he intended on taking the life of the Duke of Orleans, but when Luigi arrived a little too late in Geneva, the opportunity to do so had passed. He looked at a local newspaper, saw Elizabeth, and found out where she was staying, and he waited for her to leave that hotel. That's how easy it was. People are so creepy. Keep an eye open. If you're a queen, keep your eyes open. This is scary. Number nine. Royal curse. The remains of Polish queens and kings were discovered back in April 1931 in a crypt in Vilnius. Polish researchers didn't even know what they were in for. I mean, a storm had flooded a cathedral and they threw down sandbags to preserve the area, but on the night of April 25th, they had followed the water into this lost chamber that held the remains of Polish kings and queens. These remains, with the crowns still attached, might I add, were from the 15th century. What a find, right? Well, sadly, the remains were all over this flooded tomb now. It wasn't really in one spot. It was horrible. And now after these discoveries, that's when things got really mysterious. Those involved in the findings began to die off in unusual circumstances, one after another. And it happened pretty quick, too. One professor had died after falling down a shaft in his apartment. He had a heart attack. An engineer had died before him as well due to undisclosed medical issues. Okay. Another professor years later who worked in the crypt as well became paralyzed at age 62. A sculptor involved died when untying his shoelace. Just the weirdest way to go out. That's the only details that we know. Just, I don't know, use your imagination, I guess. Maybe he fell and hit his head. That's sad. It's tragic. And another professor died in 1936 shortly after visiting the crypt as well. I sure hope this isn't an ancient curse because these guys were trying to preserve their history and avoid the crypt from flooding. Like, I don't know, we need a Ouija board to clear this whole thing up. We were trying to help you with the sandbags. Number eight, Queen Caroline. In a list of unusual ways that people have died, odds are it's going to get a little gruesome, a little messy. After all, that's why you click this video, right? Right? Some ancient queens die natural causes and then history remembers them for their reign. In this case, history remembers Queen Caroline for the way that she died. It was written in an epigram from the 18th century from a poet named Alexander Pope. It, he wrote down, here lies wrapped up in 40,000 towels, the only proof that Caroline had bowels. It rhymes? Like, come on, man, you didn't have to do this. This is horrible. That's like a prank almost. I can't believe somebody was like, yeah, 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 write that down. That's good, that's good. Did it rhyme? Yeah, she'd like that for sure. R.I.P. Number seven, Anne Boleyn. The second wife of King Henry VIII. Yes, we have a few on this list. She was found guilty of treason and she had been charged with having sexual relationships with five others, including Lord Rochford, AKA her brother, George Boleyn. Yeah, the uh, ancient days were a little bit odd. She had also apparently had relations with Sir Henry Norris, the king's close friend. And when I say close friend, I mean he was the groom of the stool, so they were tight. He literally would wipe his So on top of this, Anne was also found guilty of conspiring to kill her husband. Now, it's since been proven that these crimes were a bunch of rubbish, basically. Anne wasn't even present when these events went down. She was still recovering from the birth of her daughter, future Elizabeth I, so there's no way in hell she was fooling around with the groom of the stool in October 1533. All five guys involved were executed on Tower Hill in May 1536, and then two days later, Anne joked about her little neck before being taken out with a sword as well. There wasn't even a coffin for her burial. Somebody had to go and get an old elm chest from the tower armory. They used a chest to bury her body near her brother, Lord Rochford. A chest, horrible, that's so horrible. Number six, Mary Queen of Scots. If you're a murderino, this one's pretty juicy, listen up. Back in 1565, Mary was determined to take the throne for herself. When Mary was just six days old, her father, King James V, had passed away, so she ascended to the throne. She was about to marry the King of France in 1558, but he passed away, so she returned to Scotland as the country's monarch. Her next plan was to marry her cousin, Lord Darnley, so now, if something were to happen to Elizabeth, Mary would be yet again lined up for the throne. That cousin ended up dying in a random explosion, and then years later, in 1568, Queen Elizabeth had welcomed Mary after she fled to England. 
So Mary was close, but now what? While Elizabeth had found out that Mary was involved in English Catholic and Spanish plots to overthrow her, so she was then placed on house arrest. Fair. More than fair. More than fair. Cut to 19 years later, 1586, a letter had emerged revealing that Mary was involved in a plot to have her cousin, Queen Elizabeth I, killed. She was then sentenced to death and her head was taken off for treason. History is dark, my friends. Even if you're family, it's, shit gets crazy. Number five, Charlotte Augusta. Princess Charlotte Augusta of Wales lost her life in 1817. And when I say ancient, this is probably the most recent that I'll go, because I know ancient means way back. I gotcha. But I have to include this one because as far as royals go, she was loved at this time. She ended up falling in love with Britain's Prince Leopold, but a year and a half later, she died giving birth. She was healthy at the time. She was only 21 years old when this happened. Charlotte was lined up to be the queen one day, and historical accounts say that the doctors here were at fault. Charlotte's tragic passing had vendors running out of black fabric. That's how rock the public was right after this. Just massive displays of grief. What do you guys think? Comment down below. Was this a doctor conspiracy or just classic medieval times? It's the olden days. We can't really do as much. Let us know. Number four, Catherine Howard. Queen of England from 1540 to 1541. Such a short amount of time, but why? Being the fifth wife of King Henry VIII, cousin to Anne Boleyn, referred to by King Henry as his rose without a thorn, he just gave her all the gifts and she was just 19 years old. Sounds great so far, but you know, because of his list, things won't end up well. Their marriage didn't even last a year until rumors, not letters or eyewitnesses, rumors started spreading about infidelity. There was a small amount of evidence that suggested that she had been romantically involved with somebody beforehand, so a jealous mad king got jealous and mad again. Shocker. You had me at fifth wife, I don't know. She was executed for adultery and treason at the Tower Green on February 13th, 1542. Number three, Catherine Parr. When Catherine Parr got a position in Princess Mary's house in 1542, she met King Henry VIII. She was smart, she was 30 years old, so it was a step in the right direction age-wise when it comes to these queens and King Henry. Not that there's anything wrong with marrying somebody younger, that's not what I'm saying, but it's just, well, look at this list. All these people died, spoiler alert. So the older, the better at least. I don't know. She was seen as somebody who could nurse the king in his dying age, so the public liked her. She was the first English queen also to write and publish her own books. Now, come 1543, Catherine gave up her man, Thomas Seymour, to marry the king. The two got married that July at Hampton Court Palace, and from that point on, her beliefs were deemed dangerous. Queen Catherine was a supporter of the English Reformation, and Catherine's religious opponents were plotting against her, and they tried to convince the king that she was dangerous. Her arrest was even planned, everything was kind of going in a bad direction, and then Catherine went to King Henry right away and then asked for forgiveness herself. You know, for pushing her views too far many times before, and he forgave her. Meanwhile, others are losing heads for having relationships. Okay. Her and Henry were married for five years, and then after his death, she married Thomas Seymour just a few months later. And then come September 1548, she died after giving birth to her daughter. The account of her death comes from a lady-in-waiting and friend of Catherine Parr, comes from Elizabeth Tyrant. Only her account is fishy because she never liked Thomas Seymour to begin with. She made it seem like Catherine was speaking about her husband in a negative manner when she was dying, and this is the only time in history where that's ever been an idea. So what do you think? It's like broken telephone, but hundreds of years ago. I'm like, I, maybe she was friends? I don't know. Sounds like conspiracy. Number two, Anne of Cleves. Where to even begin here? Okay, this one is sad, man. Anne was right in the middle of Henry's wives. She was married to King Henry for six months, and it was seen as quite strategic in a way. Henry's chief minister convinced him to marry one of the sisters of Germany's Duke of Cleves, either Anne or Amelia. So in order to decide, Henry requested that Hans Holbein travel to Cleves to paint a portrait of each sister. This is like the birth of Tinder right now. I'm not joking, this actually happened. This man compared portraits and then chose Anne because every man praiseth her beauty. She was compared to the silver moon. Yeah, try that on a dating site. I praiseth thou beauty, madam. Super swipe. A treaty was signed and a few weeks later Anne arrived to England. Henry was beyond upset because she looked nothing like she did in her portrait. Yep, real life, this is what really happened. He tried to stop the wedding because of this, but it was too late. They had to follow through and they got married on January 6, 1540. Anne later accepted the divorce because obviously a divorce was in play after what you just heard. And then she lived as the king's sister peacefully until her death in 1557. Of all the ways to be remembered in history, King Henry made this horrible for Anne. And finally, number one, Cleopatra. 
last of the Egyptian pharaohs and last on our list. One of the biggest questions to this day is just how Cleopatra died. What happened? It's been rumored for a while that a snake bite was the culprit, but many believe that Cleopatra also allowed a poisonous snake to end her life. They think it was a bite from an asp. But there's also a large amount of historians that also believe that she poisoned herself using a hairpin. Her lover Anthony fell on his own sword, but Cleopatra, she just poked herself. She barely lost blood. Now, as a young in, we have to note that Cleopatra was brilliant. She was also interested in learning specifically about chemistry. So this theory about her poisoning herself doesn't sound very far-fetched. Until we find her body, we'll really never know. What do you guys think?